Hi friends, now we are going to discuss psychiatry goal questions. We start with question number one. This is repeatedly asked topic, clozapine. Okay. Yes, in 23 NEET, the same question was asked, little bit different. Yes, they asked question, their patient is uh, taking two antipsychotic for four to six weeks, but no benefit. Uh, which drug you will give? So clozapine is drug of choice for treatment resistant schizophrenia when you say treatment resistant schizophrenia if two antipsychotics two antipsychotics suppose a patient came to me having typical symptom of schizophrenia i made the diagnosis of schizophrenia i started with olanzapine patient is not improving for four to six weeks i changed the drug halopidol four to six weeks means two antipsychotic i tried but failed Yes, no improvement. I said this is a treatment resistant schizophrenia. I will start clozapine. So this is treatment resistant schizophrenia. But clozapine, we have kept it for the last. Why? Because it is having so many side effects, serious side effects. One of them is agranulocytosis, which require regular monitoring. This was a question. Side effect for which regular monitoring is required for the patient on clozapine. The answer is. A granulocytosis, this was the answer. And second option, option B, suicidal tendency. No, clozapine has anti-suicidal property. Question has been asked, clozapine, anti-suicidal property. Yes, I do remember clozapine as close-up. Clozapine as close-up, okay? Whenever you do brush with close-up, there will be salivation. So question is asked, very common side effect, yes? This is mnemonic. Whenever you do brush, it may be close up or any other toothpaste. Salivation would be there. There, So increase salivation. If you are doing brush very rapidly, anybody who would see would say he is having scissors. Yes, close up pain. Next side effect, dose dependent side effect. Dose dependent side effect. That is generalized tonic clonic scissor. Okay, that is dose dependent. If you do brush properly, there would be no granule. A granulocytosis. Raju, tumhare daat to motiyo jaise chamak rahe hain. Mnemonic. A granulocytosis. This is very dangerous side effect. That's why we should monitor the patient every week. TLC, DLC. What I said? Every week TLC, DLC. Every week for six months this question has been asked previously in aims okay in morsley it is given four months but synopsis latest latest edition given six month question in aims was asked that you should monitor tlc dlc at least for six months every week every week okay so in this question now you can mark answer very easily side effect for which regular monitoring is required patient on pain answer is a granulocytosis yes you can give other options and any doubt you have yes again repeat question tactile hallucination in cocaine also called formication magnan phenomena magnan phenomena i remember cocaine as coca-cola yes cocaine as Coca-Cola, if you drink Coca-Cola so many so frequently, your tongue would be a little bit brown, dark brown, just like black. Question is asked that cocaine cause jet black tongue. Jet black tongue. Yes, this is mnemonic by color, mnemonic by the name. Yes, cocaine, cockroach. Yes, if a patient is taking cocaine, he may feel cockroach or insects are crawling under the skin, tactile hallucination, it is also called cocaine bug or formication or magnan phenomena, okay? So this is a repeat question. One more question, if you are using cocaine so frequently, there would be vasoconstriction, there will be perforation of nasal septum, yes, coca, Punjabi mein kehte hai, coca, coca, nitra, coca, coca, we wear coca at different places, most frequently at nose, nasal septal. The nasal septum nasal septal perforation. Okay. Now, cocaine, one question was asked. Means the topics are being repeated. So many questions has been asked recently on cocaine. A question was asked that cocaine, which of the following is not a uh, symptom of cocaine intoxication? 
cocaine cause tachycardia increase norepinephrine so increase bp tachycardia so question was asked that which of the following is not a side effect or symptom of toxicity answer was bradycardia dipsomania yes alcohol excessive desire to take alcohol how i remember by mnemonic whenever we take alcohol we should not take alcohol we all know yes but what we do we dip our finger and then we take yes few of you must be aware about that so two questions repeated topic third la bella indifference yes this is again repeat from 23 the question was in 23 neat that uh, there is a girl after such some trauma she started having blindness okay and the emotions were not matching with the loss means normally suppose a girl came to your you in emergency and she is having blindness she can't visualize anything what would be her emotion yes she would say doctor doctor please save me my eyes are gone but these patients of conversion disorder what i said conversion disorder previous name was hysteria previous name was hysteria this girl would come doctor saab i can't see yes when you will ask what is your problem she would say ela means emotions yes indifference emotions are not matching with the loss so this is seen in conversion disorder what is conversion disorder this is conscious mind preconscious unconscious whenever stress comes in our life extra stress is transferred to unconscious mind when unconscious mind is full of stress conflicts this extra conflict can be converted to symptoms converted to what i said converted to physical symptom means unconscious conflicts are converted to physical symptom just like i give example there is a girl father was scolding and she had seizure pseudo seizure that means she was having so much of conflict at her unconscious mind and she, her unconscious mind converted that extra conflict to physical symptom in the form of in the form of pseudo seizure or pseudo blindness and in this how you will recognize or you make diagnosis one symptom is labella indifference means if a person is having blindness would manifest with so much of anxiety doxa doxa please save me but in this conversion disorder she would not have emotion matching with the loss repeat question in a different way now scope criteria repeat question from nimens five year back around nimens question was asked scope criteria or questionnaire is used for eating disorder yes scope questionnaire five questions are there do you make yourself sick sick because of because you feel uncomfortably full yes s for sick s for this do you worry that you have lost control c for control over how much you eat have you recently lost more than one o so one stone okay in three month period do you believe yourself to be fat f would you say that food dominates your life so if score is more than 2 then it may be anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa yes any question yes if you want to add any thing or you want to modify option you can so this is simple question repeat question what is the antidepressant agent most likely cause persistent reaction yes that is again repeat question of pharma or you can say psychiatry trazodone okay no need to discuss which of the following is correct about lithium yes lithium always has been very high leading topic you all know lithium lithium normal side effect is fine tremors fine tremors yes if a patient is on lithium came to me i ask the patient to stretch hand when stretch hand yes there may be 
tremors. These are fine tremors. Sometimes you will find the patient, you can't see the tremors. Then what you will do? You will take a paper and put paper on the hand and you can analyze these tremors by looking at them. Okay. These are fine tremors and these are normal side effect of lithium at therapeutic dose. We don't worry. We just add beta blocker. Beta blocker. But if lithium toxicity more than 1.5 milli equivalent per liter, then it is toxicity and lithium toxicity cause tremors. So if fine tremors, then no need to worry. Just add beta blocker, cause tremor. You will check reflex. Hyperreflexia may be there. Tremors may be there. Tremor, so I have already told you, ataxia may be there. Sorry, ataxia may be there. Okay, coma, death. And you may require dialysis. So fine tremors is the answer. It is triatogenic. Yes, it causes Epstein anomaly. Repeat question, Epstein anomaly. Okay, absorbed from gut. Not approved for absences. Okay. Last question, I think. Yes, this is def definitely a new question. Yes, new drug approved for rat syndrome recently, two, three months back. This drug has been approved. This drug has been approved. Crofin, uh, yes, crofinetide, FDA approval. What is the function of this? Yes, it stimulates. Synaptic maturation. Synaptic maturation. Yes, rat syndrome. Again, repeat topic. Question was asked. Rat syndrome is having microcephaly. Question has been asked. Rat, if I draw rat like this, it's having very small head. Microcephaly. In neat, 23 question was asked. It is X-linked dominant. One question. It is exclusively found in females. Yes, previously there was a there was a statement that rat syndromes are exclusively found in females. But recently, few patient of rat syndrome found in male also, or few male rat syndrome patient has been reported. Now we started saying female more common than male. Any other question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Let's have a discussion of the questions which was in uh, INI CET uh, 23 audit. You know, the questions, if we go for the introductory part, like the questions were relatively simple. As we have already uh, told you that around 7 to 11 questions are the total number of questions which are going to be asked in relation to the orthopedics integrated with the anatomical aspect. And this is one question. The question number one is a kind of a question which they are asking every year. It is not something which you don't are aware of or which you are not aware of. All right. Like they are asking the name of the nerve, which is likely to get injured in relation to a particular segment of the bone. And likewise, the four options were formulated or um, they were given to you. Like if there is a fracture anywhere in the proximal aspect of the humerus, the name of the nerve which is likely to get injured is the axillary nerve, right? If the fracture is there in the mid one third of the humerus because the radial nerve which passes from the medial to the lateral aspect through the spiral groove, so the name of the nerve which is likely to get injured in this segment, the humerus fracture is the radial nerve. If there is an injury to the medial epicondyle, you know, this is the reason, this is the region which is medial epicondyle. And you know that posterior to the medial epicondyle, we are having the ulnar nerve. If there is a fracture, if there is a dislocation, which is resulting in the compression or impingement of the ulnar nerve, might result in its injury. So ulnar nerve injury. All right which is associated with the fracture to the medial epicondyle. And you know, the fractures which are appearing in the lateral epicondyle as a late complication of the lateral epicondyle of fracture, we are having the uh, injuries to the ulnar nerve. That is a different scenario, which was last, last year, like late complication fracture of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus might result in ulnar nerve injury. Now, that was not only the question. The question was, the essence of the question was that identity region a nerve 
Second is that they gave you specific clinical findings related to a nerve injury. Now, what are those specific findings? The first one is that, you know, difficulty in extending the distal interphalangeal joint of the medial two fingers. You know, this is interphalangeal joint of the medial two finger extension is lost. As you are very much aware of the fact that extension of this uh, interphalangeal joint of the finger is the function of the lumbricals and lumbricals, the medial two lumbricals are supplied by the ulnar nerve. So the extension of the interphalangeal joint is lost. That means they are, they are going into flexion. So one of the features related to ulnar nerve injury. Second is the second point, which is provided to you is that it results, uh, which of the following mark is structure will result in inability to hold the paper in between the fingers. What we are talking about over here is the card test. And so many times we have already discussed this phenomena that card test is basically the assessment of the adductors of the finger. Imagine if this is a card, you asking a patient to hold a card in between the two fingers tightly. As an examiner, you try to pull this out. If the patient is not able to apply resistance, if the patient is not able to hold it, that means adductors of the fingers are non-functional. That means card test is the assessment of the adductors of the fingers. But these adductors of the fingers, what are the muscles? What are the names of the muscles? What are these muscles which are known by the name of adductors of the finger? These are palmar interosseae. Palmar interosseae are supplied by the name of the nerve which is responsible for applying it is the ulnar nerve. So everything is getting everything is getting lined up. The case scenario which is provided to where he was not able to extend the interphalangeal joints. That means ulnar nerve could be injured. Now they are asking that mark the structure, which of the marked the structure, the injury could have happened to that if it also has resulted in inability to hold the paper in between the two fingers. So answer for that question is injury. That is behind the medial epicon. That is the correct answer for the question which is related to a particular topic. How many times this question has been asked? You know, in the revision class, I will do question is going to be asked definitely from the nerve injury. Now comes the next question. This is for the first time, you know, we have talked about it, that one question is going to be asked in the basic initial management of the who is landing up in emergency. And you know, any time, every time the patient comes with the pelvic fracture or pelvic instability, before even going for the definitive management, first of all, you have to stabilize the patient. And the reason for stabilities are that whenever there is a pelvic fracture, Whenever there comes a patient with a pelvic fracture, then the patient is suffering a massive blood loss. All right. That blood loss could be as high as three units of blood. Now, in order to limit this blood loss, it has to be externally stabilized as early as possible. And that is achieved by a pelvic binder. That is achieved by pelvic binder. And then you have to go for the you you have to go for the compensation of that blood loss. whatever the, which has happened you have to go for the compensation by provision of the uh, by, by the transfusion of the blood by giving the fluids by giving the crystalloids all right and then comes the compensation so hopefully everything is clear related to this now initial management always is to bind all the bones to compress the pelvis in order to limit the oozing out of the blood from the cancellous region of the bone because uh, intra uh, this massive internal hemorrhage might also result in death of the individual. All right. So the immediate management, it requires bed sheet draping around the pelvis. Imagine if you are not having that pelvic binder available, then at least uh, uh, apply a bed sheet, try to tie down definitive internal fixation. Once the patient gets stabilized, external fixation again can be done, but in just immediately they are asking. So it has to be done in the operation theater. And for performing this internal external fixation, you have to go for uh, regional anesthesia. That means the spinal anesthesia has to be provided. If the patient is already in shock, giving this spinal anesthesia might aggravate the shock. So basically first, the patient should be hemodynamically stable. Then you have to go for external fixation application. Blood transfusion, yes, it is true. But at time, the first thing that you can very easily do is limit the loss of the blood or if you are having this pelvic binder then bind the pelvis together so hopefully this question is also clear you know in the revision classes we have already talked about that there is always a possibility that they might ask you about the initial management of the pelvic fractures and this is exactly what they have asked all right 
Another question, which is again not very difficult to answer because in the revision classes also we have talked about this, that this is a kind of a hot topic which they can ask any point of time. Remember, this is not for the first time this question. Actually, this question was asked in 2000. There are multiple features which results in the malignant transformation on the basis of which the malignant transformation of the osteochondromas could be identified. But one of the most critical feature is increase in the cartilaginous cap thickness. Just imagine or just try to understand this. If this is the distal end of the femur, all right, this is the metaphysis and this is the epiphysis. This is how the osteochondroma tumor looks like. But this osteochondroma tumor is characterized by the placement of the cartilaginous cap over it. And this cartilaginous cap cannot be seen on the x-rays. It has to be visualized on the MRI. So if there is an increase, persistent increase in the thickness of the cartilaginous cap, it will result in, all right, it will, it is a feature of malignant transformation or the feature of malignant uh, changes. So increase in the thickness of the cartilaginous cap, more than two centimeter, actually, if it is even more than 1.5 centimeter, it is considered to be a most significant contributing for malignant transfer, all right? So this is particularly the answer for this question. If you talk about other questions, other options, normally it grows away from the joint. But if, if it grows towards the joint, will it be a feature for malignant transformation? Answer is no. It is a disease. But normally, osteoarthritis it grows from the joint. But if it grows towards the physis, then it is a rare phenomena. It is known by the name of Trevor disease. All right. So it, it has got nothing to do with the prognosis that it might be malignancy. If you go to the option number three, that bone marrow continuity in tumor and parent bone. You know, this is a normal phenomena. There has to be a bone marrow continuity in between the osteochondroma lesion and the parent bone. If the bone marrow continuity, then it is not considered osteochondroma. All right. So this option option is also true, but it has got nothing to do with the malignancy. It is a normal feature of osteochondroma developmental normality. Now the option number four, is it the developmental abnormality? As I told you in the lectures also, we have discussed that previously it was considered to be a developmental abnormality, but today it is found it is considered to be a true benign tumor of the bone. And yes, it ceases the growth of the tumor. It ceases to grow beyond skeletal maturity. This is the normal characteristic finding of the tumor. All right. So all the other options, they are not signifying that whether they is, it could be associated with the malignancy or not. The most important feature which hints that there is a possibility of malignant transformation goes in the favor of increasing cartilaginous thickness of beyond 1.5 centimeter in its maximum dimension. So that is possibly the answer for this question. Hopefully everything is clear. You know, osteochondroma related questions today are very commonly asked. Next is a direct repeat uh, probably from the uh, NEAT PG 2023. It is a kind of the question where the x-ray in the form of a shepherd crook deformity is given. We have discussed it also in the uh, quick revision session. You know, the patient presented with the following abnormality on the x-ray along with the pale brown macular rashes over the skin, over the abdomen. So what are these? These are cafe ulay spots. So basically they are asking about the Macune Albright syndrome. All of you should be aware of what are the features of Macune Albright syndrome. Macune Albright is basically consisting of three features, three findings are there. The first one is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. And how will you identify a fibrous dysplasia x-ray on, um, uh, on the uh, uh, fibrous dysplasia on the x-rays? You know, this is the compressive cortex as we have already talked about the mean is compressive cortex and the left the tensile cortex. Imagine this, this structure is fibro-osseous tissue then compressive cortex loses its strength and under the weight bearing forces more and more compression of the compressive cortex. And this compression this go, which goes beyond the normal will result in of the bone in the form of a shepherd crook. So shepherd crook deformity is something on the basis of which you will identify the axis of fibrous dysplasia. And in puberty, all of you are aware of the fact that precocious puberty is just the earlier of the secondary sexual characteristics in case of females. And the third one is the cafe ulay spot. So these are irregular borders, cafe ulay spots, which are scattered over the trunk, abdomen or axilla. 
uh, coffee colored brown colored spots other condition where you can see this cafe ula spot is neurofibromatosis type 1 but here in case of macunel bright syndrome they are going to be having irregular borders irregularities while in case of neurofibromatosis type 1 it is going to have a regular border so it is a clear cut question you already are aware of the answer for that particular question answer for that question was macunel bright syndrome now next you know, so many times we have talked about that this is one such complication which is very dreadful and as a resident medical officer, you should be able to identify it. The topic that we are talking about is the fat embolism syndrome, one of the dreadful complications of the fractures, fat embolism syndrome. Now, what happens in fat embolism syndrome? A long bone is fractured. Because of this fracture in the long bone, there is a possibility of the fat globules from the medullary canal to reach the circulation. All right. So fat globules might reach the circulation. And once they reach the circulation, there will be an appearance of the key clinical features. How will you identify those clinical features? There will be fever. There will be tachypnea. And there's going to be tachycardia. So fever, tachypnea, tachycardia. These are the alarming clinical features for fat embolism syndrome. But how will you identify that the patient might be landing up in fat embolism syndrome? which is explained by the petechial rash. So petechial rash, which has scattered over the trunk, abdomen, and over the conjuncta and two, and these are considered to be pathognomonic lesion. And over a period of time, what happens if this emboli reaches the circulation in the pulmonary circulation, it will result in the respiratory distress and it might also result in coma. That means the patient gets unconscious and eventually death of the patient. So a dreadful application which is related to the release of these fat globules into the circulation. So hopefully the answer for this question is very much evident, very much clear. There should not, shouldn't be any confusion related to it. That if there is a TBL fracture 12 hours after he became unconscious, axillary petechial lesions and breathlessness is present, what is the most probable diagnosis the patient is presenting with? Answer for that question is fat embolism syndrome. Simple, path based on the pathognomonic features. Next question is related to the superior gluteal, you know, were talking about we i have also told that hundred multiple of the times like uh examination of hip is something which is now not uh, restricted to the postgraduates examination of hip related questions are going to be asked relevantly in each and every of your examination and this question is pertained or related to the trend dillenberg test simply what they are asking is that what is the name of the nerve superior gluteal nerve and what is the name of the muscle it size so answer for that question is gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. You know, superior gluteal nerve is responsible for supplying the gluteus medius as well as gluteus minimus. While inferior gluteal nerve is responsible for supplying the gluteus maximus muscle. And gluteus medius and minimus, they are basically the abductors as well as the external rotators of the hip joint. And these, uh, these abductors of the hip joint, they are basically responsible for abduction mechanism, which is used or assessed in Trendelenburg or Trendelenburg sign. So it was a simplified question, one liner without any difficulty. As far as the last question for the examination is concerned, here we're having a discrepancy, here having a dislocation which has happened in between the clavicular and the acromion bone. All right. That means there is a dislocation in at the acromioclavicular junction. Now they are asking, what is the name of the ligament tear? Because there is no fracture associated with it. What is the name of the ligament? might result in this kind of an injury. So simply, the means it is not very difficult to understand that acromioclavicular ligament will result in this kind of a dislocation. Imagine, if this is the clavicular bone, here we are having the acromion bone, all right? And here we are having the head of the humerus, and this is the glenoid. So this is the normal arch uh, uh, architecture of the shoulder joint, and here in between we are having the ligament. But here there is a corecoid process and there is a clavicular corecoid ligament also. Now, in case if there is a tear or rupture of this ligament, that means acromioclavicular ligament, there will be a proximal migration of the clavicle. So this will result in the acromioclavicular injury. But you know what is happening over here? That it goes far beyond the normal confines. This thing goes far beyond the normal confines. So not only the acromio ligament injury. It could also be associated with the coreco clavicular injury. That means both acromio of a dislocation which is considered to be type 3 dislocation according to acromio clavicular subluxation injuries. So 
hopefully everybody related to what we have discussed in this uh, recall session of the orthopedics as far as uh, the questions are concerned i tell you that 90% of the questions were from, came from the repeat topics like just 20 to 25 top here out of it all the questions are getting accumulated and they are asked again and again or are getting repeated again and again uh, all the best thank you so much all the best for your <coughs> future So hello dear students, you have given the exam, it was wonderful. This time we had around 14-15 questions, students, this is an INICT recall. So the only source of questions were you people. So many of the students who have given the paper, they have recalled the questions for us. And uh, to be very honest, I have not given the paper, so I exactly don't know the exact question. So I sincere apologies in advance if you find anything like that was not there in the question. So you can always type in the comment section that what was the real, real options or real. So let us start with this question, uh, with a basic approach uh, towards the surgery this time. The surgery this time was absolutely conceptual. There was no Tom Dick Harriet based questions. It was totally concept based questions. We had certain images. We had actually more of gastro also this time, less of general surgery this time. This was the first time when we had no questions on sutures or maybe uh, the needles, etc. So coming to the questions from GIT, we had a question where MRCP was shown. And if you talk about this MRCP, it's very, very, very evident from the, you can say image that this is the hilum. This is, uh, I'll take different color. Okay. So this is, this is hilum. This is the left. This is the right duct. And you have right anterior posterior, anterior posterior and left medial lateral. When you talk about this, this is CBD. So if you see, this is CBD and probably this is the dust stone. This is the cystic duct, which is having the stone in the cystic duct also. So no contrast is there. You So that is why the gallbladder is not visible. But here, multiple filling defects in the CBD. So this is a classical image of cholelithiasis. So cholelithiasis is the answer for this. This is a very, very, very simple, straightforward question. Already I have discussed such similar images a lot of times. Next is, there was a question on the SFJ incompetency. So when we talk about SFJ incompetency, it's very, very, very important for you to understand what are the clinical tests for SFJ incompetency. So you know there are a lot of tests when we, like if you talk about broadly standalone bug tests, we elevate the limb and then we tie a tunicate below this and then we actually allow the limb to fill. So if when, when, when we release the tunicate, we see the pattern, how the, how the limbs are, limb is getting filled. So if it is proximal to, from top, so from the near of SFJ, it is coming from down. So top to down, it is SFJ incompetency. If it is coming from down to up, it is the perforator incompetency. The lot of things that we talk, can talk about this. So Trendelenburg test, this is what, again, we have modified Perthes, modified Perthes. Then we have Morrissey's. These are the classical tests that we have for SFJ incompetency. Then we have Pratt's. We have a Pratt's. We have a Fegan's test. These are for the perforator incompetency. When we talk about the perforator, incompetent perforator, there is always a depression. So you can feel a subfacial depression, and the presence of that subfacial depression is what we see in the Fegan sign. So very simple, straightforward question. Now, then there was a question from uh, the lower GIT. We had a question from the rectal prolapse. So when we talk about the rectal prolapse, it is simple that the management of rectal prolapse nowadays, perineal approaches are less preferred. But either you can go for from the abdominal approach or you can go for the from the perineal approach. Students, Thiersch is a perineal approach where you do an uncirclage, encirclage wiring. This is for uh, the patients who are absolutely not fit for surgery. Nowadays, no one is doing this. Altemir is actually perineal recto, uh, perineal recto sigmoidic tummy and along with that pexy. So you remove the redundant, you can say rectum along with some sigmoid colon if required and then, then you do the pexy. So Altemir, Thiers, Delorme, you do a reefing of the prolapse part. Remember, Ripstein is an abdominal. Ripstein, Moskowitz. Ripstein, Moskowitz, they are abdominal rectosacropexy. So this is what is very simple question. Ripstein is not a perineal approach. Next question on amoebic liver abscess. Let me tell you, the patient presented to you with a history of diarrhea of from 6-8 weeks. Along with that, recent onset of upper 
right upper quadrant pain, ultrasound shows an abscess-like profile in the liver. So what it could be? It is probably the amoebic liver abscess. Remember, pyogenic liver abscess will not have a dysenteric sort of profile and along with that, jaundice will also be dominating the profile. So cholangitis-like profile. Then hydatidosis will not have again a dysentery-like profile and you will have a different presentation on the USG. So it's a classical amoebic liver abscess. Very straight, very simple question. Now this is a question belonging to pathology, medicine, everywhere, everyone is asking. So all the options are quite close. Massive blood transfusion protocol. There we have studied in surgery also, in pathology also. So massive blood transfusion might result in Lot of things, all of them are right. Hypothermia, citrate toxicity, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia. Remember, hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia is more prominent than hypokalemia. So, students, it's an art of segregation. You need to learn to segregate. Here, relatively, there's a lot of exclusion here. If you ask me, all of them are seen. Next is breast conservation surgery. Suppose this is a lump. You are simply going to remove the lump. So, so this is what is lumpectomy basically. Or we can say that this is wide local excision. So wide local radiotherapy is not compulsory if you are doing it for in-situ tumors. So only if resi residual tissue is left over. So this is also right. Now the third thing is intraoperative frozen section is required. Not always required. It is not always required. And same way, axillary node dissection. If this is the option, students, based upon your recall, we have put up some options. So axillary lymph node dissection might be done in case of sentinel lymph node biopsy is positive. So amongst them, the option three is the most non-feasible option here. Next is, there was a question on edema of the trunk, gangrene-like image. Students, I couldn't get, I couldn't recall all the options. So one was maybe blister due to burn. So definitely uh, blister uh, due to burn will not in gangrene at least so i am not you know about the options do put in the comment section options for this question next is there was an of uh ranula stick swelling cystic swelling with a bluish capsule or oh, this i think that the image that most of the students are agreeing to so swelling over the floor of the mouth and this uh, is probably a renula, a renula. Not much information could be gathered if this is the answer image. This is the most probable answer. There was an uh, there was an ultrasound image, so I will uh, show that image at the end, and I will discuss that question again. Seventy three year old patient presenting with acute bleeding PR, and now what is or you can say chronic bleeding PR. Some resource some resources have said chronic bleeding PR. What is the best test? students when it is bleeding per rectum? Colonoscopy and CCT are the most probable or the best you can show investigation to rule out any tumor or any other pathology, which is maybe benign in nature. So this is what is very, very, very important. We will go for a colonoscopy and CCT in this case. Next is there was a question on the fracture shaft of the femur where the patient presented with the, uh, the rashes and uh, the patient presented with unstable status. This is a case of fat embolism. So fat embolism or pulmonary embolism are the probable reason developing an acute, you can say, uh, distress, respiratory distress with unstable status. And in case of fracture pelvis, this is the most probable answer. So fat embolism seems to be the most probable. I couldn't get the options. If you have, you should type it out. Next is, uh, there was a question on breast, uh, CA breast management. So which of the following is the second line treatment if the trastuzumab is resistant? So this is a question of pharmacology. Your pharmacology, sir, will discuss this. But yes, I know about some options that lapatinib, yes, it's a drug which is the second line for, for the resistant patients which are resistant to Herceptin. You will use this. It was that's used for basal cell cancer, then erlotinib for lung cancer, then uh, vemurafenib is there. So, sorafenib, vemurafenib, lot of drugs are there which uh, are used, uh, I think, for that uh, liver cancers and uh, RCCs, but I'm not a, I'm not going to this question. So, pharmacology faculty will discuss this question and options in detail. Next is, okay, that's, that, that's the same question. There was question where I have uh, researched on this question where people had shown that the contents after reduction, the, the, it was found that the contents were not there properly in this 
what could be this hernia students this is a classical image of sliding what is sliding hernia sliding hernia is a hernia where one wall of the sac is formed by a viscera so it may be on the left side it is long sigmoid it may be the small intestine sometimes you know the with this case is when you cut open the sac you have a tendency to damage this so understand that sliding the classical question on sliding hernia the option the questions are still you can say under the under the consideration any of you i can understand that since you are not a surgeon so it becomes very difficult to recall all the questions you are attempting all the subjects so but as far as i have gathered the information this was a question on sliding hernia they had uh, given the images post reduction pre reduction and there was one part of the bowel was forming the sac next is rta with the fracture of the pelvis and the patient is in hypotension and shock is there what should be the next line of treatment so what should we do so blood transfusion massive massive blood transfusion should be done then binding the pelvis and the trochanter with a bed sheet on external fixation right now resuscitation of the patient is again very important so what i would say option 1 as far as uh, this is concerned is the first thing you'll stabilize and then only you can go for fixation or reduction whatever you want next is there was a question match the following base question images Uh, 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 different images showing you the position of the appendix retrocecal subcecal so uh, these are the these are the options and you know the this uh, image very well have has been discussed a lot of times in class also intermittent claudication of this is again a doubtful question from wherever i am getting the information all the options are wrong which is not seen or which is uh, whatever is the question is in intermittent uh, claudication what is not seen rest pain at night remember rest pain at night is not seen remember rest pain cramps that nocturnal cramps are not the feature of intermittent claudication pain starts on taking the first step mostly it is not so patient walks a distance that is known as claudication distance after which the pain starts so actually this is also wrong most common cause of atheroma atheroma is not equal to embolism or you can say thrombus so this is also wrong it is aggregation of uh, you can say cholesterol and uh, platelets forming this probably we can consider this in clinical presentation is not related to affected site this is also wrong because claudication always justifies the level of block so if it is the thigh which is getting claudicated it means that it is a femoropopliteal block no it is above that so thigh so it is outer femoral or ilio femoral so that depends upon where the claudication site is so this is again all the options are wrong in this case all the options i don't know what why the students have recalled such a question but i have tried to get the sources i have tried to get options from various sources i did not find any of them right all of them are wrong in this case smoking is a risk factor for fibroadenoma no monders carcinoma and ductectation the known risk factors for uh, they are known to get uh, associated with the smoking so smoking is not a risk factor for fibroadenoma rest all three options are right in this case next is this is again a question which dermatology faculties will discuss so these are the blaschko's versus langer's line versus hindrus line so this uh, dermatology faculty will be discussing for you in detail then there was a question on banana sign on usg spina bifida or arnold carey malformation that is associated with i don't know who has recalled this options but this is what i got so i this is not my part but yes usg uh, showing you spina bif in spina bifida you may get a banana sign arnold carey malformations there was again a question not related to the third part of the duodenum remember body of the gallbladder and trunk of the gallbladder third part is retroperitoneal and remember these are intraperitoneal so this is not associated next is i have already discussed this question complications of parenteral nutrition it's a very easy question parenteral nutrition is via alimentary tract no it is via iv route so how can aspiration be uh, how can aspiration happen so aspiration is not seen in these cases so there was again one question on incidentaloma yeah so adrenal incidentaloma most common type uh, or most common cause so when we talk about adrenal incidentaloma the most of them are non functioning in nature so it was functioning non functioning majority of them are non functioning then there was a question on hyperparathyroidism also i couldn't recall the options so i couldn't frame a proper question i'll definitely get back to you people with a properly framed question dysuria fang plane and stone so you know 
poly uh, polyuria or you can say polyuria polydipsia and flank pain maybe is due to the stone so this is a classical uh, scenario which we see with hyperparathyroidism and then uh, you get a question on fibrin's cap also so there was a gallbladder image in which the fibrin's cap was also there so where is that image i couldn't get it for you it was an ultrasound image where where you get to see a double you can say uh, fibrin cap is something like this so this is a fibrin cap gallbladder a USG image was uh, shown in this. So I hope you enjoyed this small crisp discussion. So we had 14, 15 questions, but they were all very easy and straightforward. They were concept based. This time you didn't have all one liners and nothing like those syndromes. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Thank you for watching and listening to me. Okay, okay. So hi, evening friends, evening everybody. Bache. I'm sure you went, gave the INI exam. The questions were slightly tricky with respect to pathology, no doubt about it. The topics were repeated. They were, I have about, this is the first recall session. I have about 16, 17 questions with me. The out of these 16, 17 questions, about eight to nine questions were the previous year questions and the remaining were the new topics. So Let's quickly have a look at our INI exam recall with respect to pathology. Now, starting with our first and a comparatively simple, easier question. Which of the following is not a common site for metastatic calcification? You very well know that calcification is of two types, dystrophic and metastatic. Dystrophic calcification occurs in dead or damaged tissue versus metastatic calcification, which is seen in normal tissue. The most common site of metastatic calcification being lungs, other than lungs, it is also seen in kidney, that is in the renal tubules, as well as the stomach, that is gastric mucosa, which is not a which is not a common site, that is parathyroid. Next question. CD40 is absent on B cells, which if this is the same neat PG2019 question. They had given a flow cytometry dot plot dot plot for analysis with respect to the hyper IgM syndrome. If CD40 is absent on B cells, what is the diagnosis? That is hyper IgM syndrome. Hyper IgM syndrome, this is a defect in immunoglobulin class switching. IgM antibody is increased. So the main issue is it is associated with inability to produce other antibodies, that is IgG, IgA, and IgE. Next, iron profile in iron deficiency anemia. A very simple, straightforward question, nothing major. These four options were given. In iron deficiency anemia, the examiner did not even go into the three stages of IDA, that is stage one reduced iron stores, stage two iron deficient erythropoiesis, or stage three MCH. He did not get into any of that. He simply asked you that it is associated with low ferritin. Serum iron reduces, there is reduced transfer in saturation as well as TIBC increases. So all four, all four were, are associated with iron deficiency anemia. Next question. Now, this is tricky. Massive blood transfusion. What do we mean by massive blood transfusion? It is giving more than 1x in 24 hours or half x in 4 hours, where x is amount of blood in body. So, so you are replacing the whole blood of the patient with stored blood. When you're replacing the whole blood by stored blood, see what is happening to calcium in stored Blood. Calcium is reduced. That is the page. It is a, so hypokalcemia is seen from the blood to body temperature. Both hypokalemia as well as hyperkalemia and hypomagnesemia. So all the four options are same. But but which is the most significant, or what will I be choosing as the answer? The best possible answer in this case being hypokalcemia. Next, order of drawing blood in vacutaneous, a simple, straightforward point. We The basic rule for the order of draw of blood is to prevent carryover of anticoagulant. If you know this, we follow this order to prevent the carryover of anticoagulant. You know the, you know the color scheme. That is blue, which is sodium citrate. See, first to be used is culture tube. We do not want absolutely any contamination in the culture tube. Followed by blue, that is sodium citrate, 
red that is the plain tube lavender that is erythia and lastly is gray which is for glucose g for glucose g for gray which has sodium fluoride and oxalate so the order of drawing blood being blue red lavender and gray next there were two questions from amyloidosis in the sinai exam the first was pretty straightforward hemodialysis associated amyloidosis how many kidneys do we have if we have not purchased an iphone we have two kidneys, beta 2 microglobulin. So hemodialysis associated amyloidosis, beta 2 microglobulin. Versus A beta, which is Alzheimer's disease. A beta is Alzheimer's. AL, amyloid light chain, is primary amyloidosis, that is multiple myeloma. Versus ATTR or transthyretin, that which is associated with senile cerebral amyloidosis. You know that. So hemodialysis associated amyloidosis, beta 2 microglobulin. This was the first question. The second question, the second question with respect to amyloid was all are true except, except. So it is not associated with secondary amyloidosis. Secondary amyloidosis is the protein getting deposited is AA. Beta pleated sheets are seen on X ray crystallography. Congo red is the stain used for amyloid. Fair enough. So the answer was one AL is primary amyloidosis and not secondary. Next question was from blood banking. Again, a simple straightforward. Which of the following? Which of the following is true? But if platelets are stored at room temperature, that is 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. If we keep bananas at room temperature, they will go back in five days. So the shelf life is five days. This was correct. Cryoprecipitate is minus 30. Shelf life is one year. Packed RBCs in SAGM. RBCs, they are always cold. They are not frozen. That is 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. This is wrong. It is at 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. Shelf life, 35 days. Next, most commonly used, most commonly used is CPDA, 35 days. SAGM, SAGM, shelf life, 42 days. Shelf life is 42 days. Next point. Most common cause, next question. Most common cause of hypercoagulable status. Most common genetic cause of hypercoagulable state being factor 5 leaden mutation and i'm sure that majority of the students would have been right in this the next prospective question in this can be what can be the problem because of factor what is the issue or which is the mutation associated with factor 5 leaden mutation arginine is converted to glutamine at 506 amino acid the main issue being the conversion of arginine to glutamine at 506 amino acid which in turn leads to resistance to activated protein C. So leading to hypercoagulable state. If activated protein C is not able to act, there's resistance to activated protein C. This in turn leads to a hypercoagulable state, most common genetic cause being factor V leaden Next, now immunofluorescence of ANA. This is something that I am always after your life. This is again a repeated previous year question of last year's INA exam only, and you were given this image. Immunofluorescence patterns of ANA, which are very, very important. This is anti centromeric pattern. You are able to see the presence of single spots against centromeres. Anti centromeric pattern. Anti centromeric. Of course, it is not homogeneous. In homogeneous, the whole cell, let me actually use a green color here. In the homogeneous pattern, the whole cell appears green versus speckled. Have a look at this. This is the speckled pattern of immunofluorescence where you're able to appreciate the presence of large empty areas. This is speckled. Large empty areas are seen speckled versus anti-syndromeric pattern, presence of this locus type, which is the antibody present in localized type of systemic sclerosis, anti-centromeric antibody. How do we know that? If if the girls, while you're scolding us, what do you say? You're so localized to yourself. You are so centric to yourself. So anti-centromeric antibody, anti-centromeric antibody is seen in systemic sclerosis, localized type. Versus, versus, this is the speckled pattern. Next question. The electron microscopic image was given. 
now i know some of the students have told me we have had numerous students doing the recall with us but this was not the electron microscopic image given to you this is peripheral smear versus the second image this is electron microscopy this is also helicell leukemia but what i have been told is that the electron microscopic image that was given showed even more classical hairy cell projections so that there was absolutely no doubt about the fact that it is hairy cell leukemia you know on bone marrow biopsy hairy cell leukemia bone marrow aspirate is a dry tap on bone marrow biopsy see this is what hairy cells look like imagine many such cells lying together in bone marrow biopsy giving it the classical fried egg giving it the classical fried egg or the honeycomb appearance fried egg or honeycomb appearance hairy cell looking next question next a straightforward question from general pathology so this actually tells us and for all the juniors who will be appearing in the neat pg 2024 exam which you do not leave general path going wrong in a general path question loses you a rank majority of the top 5000 rankers will be marking all the questions right in general path so all are true with necrosis i do not have all the options with me but it is associated with inflammation and cellular swelling the next the what i have been told as the answer in this case is it was written that it is both physiological and pathological this is wrong it is not it is both physiological and pathological in nature this is wrong it is only pathological in nature another general path question that was asked was with respect to anti apoptotic genes anti apoptotic any anti apoptotic proteins any protein with with an l in it is anti apoptotic that is bcl2 bcl xl mcl1 flip any protein with l in it is anti apoptotic except bcl xs which is pro apoptotic that is the only exception to this so the answer to be marked here was bcl2 answer was bcl2 next smudge cells in peripheral smear last year's neat pg question smudge cells are a feature of CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We are seeing smudge cells on peripheral smear pointing towards CLL. So, what is the next step? Flow cytometry. So, CLL is the B cell neoplasm, which is the B cell marker CD19. If it is a biopsy positive. Again, any other combination of CD markers or not, you need to know that CLL is CD19 positive, 5 positive, 23 positive. CLL, so the next step is flow cytometry. Next. Next question was with respect to trisomies. I need not even tell you this. Downs is trisomy 21. But owls, it even has T in it. Trisomy 13. Edwards, trisomy 18. It was a match the following question. Simple and straightforward. And lastly, lastly, a patient is suffering from suffered from a severe root traffic. There's a rash over axilla with unstable vitals, which is a case of fat embolism. Root traffic accident. One to three days after which there is rash and dyspnea. This is the classical history of fat embolism. So, and I guess this is an FMG question plus i am sure that nobody so which is these were with respect to the pathology questions and needless to say best test of luck for the result may your result be much better than you expect take care take care and good luck hmm. instant start or lag time Hello students and welcome uh, to the analysis of recall questions of forensic medicine in today's INI CET exam. Uh, in total, we have seen that there are uh, seven questions which we are going to discuss in the segment of forensic medicine. So let's not waste time and let's uh, begin towards the discussion of our first question. The first question is, uh, there is a patient of gunshot injury uh, who presents 
to you in hospital or uh, maybe he is dead but uh, the question says who presents to you uh, only an abrasion collar only an abrasion collar is uh, seen apart from the entry wound so in this question what we can see is that there is an entry wound let's say this is an entry wound which may be seen on the dead body and up around that entry wound there is a presence of uh, what we call in forensic as abrasion collar right and question is fairly simple what could be the possible range of shot if we want to understand the possible range of shot just understand this concept very simply that if we have a gun which has been fired there are few things which come out of the gun the first thing that come out of the gun is fire itself and wherever there is fire there is bound to be presence of smoke so we have smoke coming out of the barrel and apart from fire and smoke the third thing which comes out of the barrel is the unburnt or partly burnt gunpowder particle matter so we have unburnt or partly burnt gunpowder particle matter also coming out of the barrel right now if these things are going to strike a person they are going to produce certain impact on the body right what are the impacts that they produce smoke it produces blackening fire produces burning or singeing of the area and gunpowder particles they produce what is called as gunpowder tattooing okay so we have blackening burning singeing and tattooing effects that could be seen along with the entry wound which is produced by the bullet itself now when bullet is entering into the body as the bullet is rotating on its axis also because of the rotation of the bullet with the edges of the skin through which the bullet is passing the bullet causes friction in that area around the entry hole and that friction is visible to us around the entry hole as abrasion collar so abrasion collar is an outcome of bullet entering into the skin itself so abrasion collar is directly produced by the bullet right now in the question we have been given that abrasion collar is present and an entry wound is present there is no blackening no tattooing no burning or no singeing if blackening blackening plus burning plus tattooing is present we are talking about close range okay if there is blackening plus tattooing that is no burning is present it means that fire could not reach the person it is called as near range okay if only tattooing is present it could be near to something called as an intermediate range it could be near to inter mediate range and if the person is in contact with the weapon then a muzzle impression mark may be seen around the entry wound also so it could not be contact range because no such finding has been given to us what has been given to us is that only abrasion collar and an entry wound is present which means the bullet has been shot from 
a distance which is quite far from the body so that neither fire nor smoke nor tattooing particles could reach the body and such a range is called as distant range so correct answer here should be distant range shot okay let's move on to our next question the next question is a fairly straightforward question uh, doesn't need much of a discussion blackfoot disease is caused by the answer is arsenic poisoning it's an outcome of arsenic poisoning basically uh, it's a peripheral vascular gangrene that happens due to chronic arsenic exposure next question now this is a kind of a tricky question uh, that students have told uh, they have told that in exam uh, there was a photograph which showed uh, appearance of uh, blackish appearance on the chest and abdomen with uh, certain uh, you know uh, reddened areas of kind of burst blisters and there was a blister also which probably was visible on the photograph so the best photograph uh, which i am lining up for you is uh, something like this uh, so black and appears on the chest we can see on the photograph and then there could be presence of a big blister somewhere in the lower part of the chest and maybe some areas of reddened you know small blisters or probably what i understand is those are blisters which have been broken so the raw area underneath the base of the blister that is red in appearance now the question was fairly simple the photograph was shown and it was asked uh, what could give rise to this appearance the options are antimortem burns causing blisters barbiturate poisoning erythema due to edema due to chemical burns or amphigus vulgaris right now if you look at this question forensically right there are three important choices which correlates with the forensic aspect of the question that is option a b and c pampigus vulgaris also tends to have uh, uh, you know uh, eruptions on the body but then when these eruptions subside they uh, they uh, they end up creating eroded skin in that area right so in the photograph there was no eroded skin that was shown okay so this kind of rules out okay chemical burns they generally are also ruled out by the finding that when chemical burns happen the area is reddened uh, they can give rise to uh, generation of certain blisters but uh, their appearance is not blackish if it is not any corrosive burn which can lead to generation of s char and by the time those s chars will be formed on the body to give a blackish kind of an appearance due to acid burns of the skin blistering would not be seen okay so it doesn't look to be a picture of an edema due to chemical burn third is barbiturate poisoning now barbiturate poisonings can lead to generation of blisters very very commonly called as barbiturate blisters uh, but the finding of those blisters is very pathognomic those blisters generally are generated in those areas where the skin is under pressure like uh, interdigital cleft areas where the skin is in constant friction like forearms when you keep forearms on desk like inner aspect of thighs okay or when we sit on a chair gluteal aspect so those are the areas where barbiturate blisters tend to develop and when these blisters become old they also tend to give blackish appearance to the skin but in the photograph a chest and an abdominal picture has been shown so the area rules out barbiturate poisoning so what we are left by default is antimortem burns causing blisters as we have been shown that blisters of 
एंटीमोर्टम बर्न्स हैव रेड इनफ्लेम्ड रॉ एरिया बिनीथ विच इज कॉल्ड एज दी बेस of the blisters so probably what was shown in the photograph was an antimortem burn uh, with blackening over the area so the photograph was given giving a blackened appearance with a blister being uh, generated because of the antimortem burn and just beneath it a few reddened areas were seen where probably uh, there could have been certain more blisters which were broken so underneath red and raw area appearance was visualized so correct answer should be antimortem burns with blister formation okay let's move to our next question a person has died from drowning so in the question itself the cause of death has been given that a person has died from drowning all are probable signs of antimortem drowning except so question itself is asking probable signs right not confirmatory signs so any probable sign which could lead the investigator to a probability that yes this could be possible in antimortem drowning could be a probable sign right so if you look at option water in stomach is it possible in cases of antimortem drowning yes is it possible in cases of postmortem drowning it may be possible but largely if it is highly filled with water is go it goes in favor of an antimortem drowning okay so this is a probable sign so it is okay second is washer woman hands okay does wash and woman hand generate in cases of antimortem drowning the answer is yes does wash and woman hands generate in postmortem drowning uh, or i should say in cases where the person is already dead and then the dead body has been thrown into water the answer remains yes is there is a is there a difference between the two findings or appearances the answer is no in both the cases whether it is an antimortem drowning or a post mortem drowning when that bleaching and hardening of hand and feet skin happens which is called as shortening or washer woman hands and feet uh, the appearance is same it starts to generate in fingertips within the first 2 hours and it progresses to the back of the hand in 24 hours and same happens in cases of foot also so it does not create any clear picture that whether finding whether this finding would be going in favor of an antimortem or a postmortem drowning so is it a probable uh, uh, sign of antimortem drowning the answer is no this is not a probable sign of antimortem drowning diatoms test coming positive is a probable sign of antimortem drowning and white froth coming from mouth and nostril is a very <laughs> highly probable sign of antimortem drowning so in this case uh, all are probable signs of antimortem drowning except the answer is presence of washer woman hands and feet also known as shortening let's move to the next one which one of the following is false so statements are given adipocere occurs after body come out of water which appears to be a correct or a true statement because adipocere generate we learn that in high moisture content right cadaveric spasm occurs in specific muscles this is also a true statement uh, because contrary to uh, rigor mortis cadaveric spasm generally uh, does not involve the generalized muscles of the body it only involves certain specific muscles of the body most commonly those muscles are muscles of hand then third is post mortem lividity is seen in lower limbs in death due to drowning now this 
seems to be a false statement because in drowning, post-mortem lividity or post-mortem staining as we say it is more commonly seen in head, neck and chest areas. Okay. And that too, if the drowning has still water, where the body is still, it is not rotating or revolving all the time. In lower limbs, post-mortem staining is highly expected to be developed in cases of hanging where the body remains erect so that the, de the, uh, uh, the dependent portion of the body are the feet itself, right? And fourth option, you will see greenish color over the right iliac fossa is an early sign of putrefaction. This also is a true statement. When we see a right iliac fossa discoloration coming uh, in a dead body, uh, we say that it is the earliest external sign indicating that decomposition or putrefaction has begun in body. The timing of this right iliac fossa discoloration is 18 hours. We learn that uh, when we go through the topic of postmortem changes. So, in this question, uh, which of the following statement is false? What appears to be false is option number C. Right. Next is, which of the following is not a part of right slogan for snake bite treatment? Okay. So, when we talk about snake bite treatment, uh, there is a slogan available to educate all the peripheral caregivers okay in our country which is called as right it is also called as do it right it is also called as do it right so in a case of snake bite do it right what is do it right right is the mnemonic you can say like that it involves Reassurance, you give reassurance to the patient. Then with I, it is immobilization. Okay. Then with GHT, it is go to hospital. Right. Go to hospital goes with gh okay go to hospital goes with gh and with t it means tell the doctor so to educate any kind of peripheral treatment to common public uh, what is being told to them is that whenever you have a snake bite victim reassure the patient immobilize the lip, go to the hospital, tell the doctor what you have seen. This is called as right slogan. Okay. So, in right, what is not included is giving any incision to that area. So, no incision has to be given. Next, uh, this question again uh, is a slightly uh, newer kind of a question because it looks like a probably new kind of poisoning has been asked in this question after a long, long, long time. Let's read this question. Child went with grandmother to a temple and while returning uh, or after returning, he started to cry um, inconsolably. So the child is uncontrollably, inconsolably crying. He is taken to a hospital uh, where breathlessness is noted, sweating is noted. Uh, some people say altered mental status or altered centrosurium was also given. The skin is cold and then priapism, a very important indicator was given in the question. Priapism was noted and uh, his capillary filling time was increased and his respiratory rate was also increased. The question asked what treatment should be given. If you want to start to see what treatment could be given to us, uh, this child in the question, 
we first have to identify that what could be the reason for this sudden uh, you know uh, health status of this child so it looks like uh, because nothing else has been given in the question no trauma no rta nothing else it looks like the child has been intoxicated and acute intoxicating findings are present right but again in the question it was not given that the child has eaten something so it looks like he has suffered from an irritant organic poison that is animal origin poison of animal origin and uh, two such irritant inorganic poisons uh, or animals that come to mind are snake and scorpion now priapism is one finding which goes in favor of a scorpion bite okay although in rare cases snake bites can also lead to priapism but literature says priapism can happen it can happen due to parasympathetic effects of scorpion bite right rest all the features can be seen in both the cases the only other differentiating factor is the uncontrollable cry of that child because in scorpion bite the sting is more painful than a bite of a snake so it looks like he had a scorpion bite the sting is very painful the person the child is crying uncontrollably with findings of priapism uh, so what should be given the answer here is option b priapism okay in this question anti snake venom uh, was a choice it has been reported prazosin has been reported as a choice adrenaline has been reported by certain student as a choice and fourth uh, choice probably was uh, some other drug uh, that has not been correctly reported so it has been kept as a question mark but correct answer uh, is prazosin because it looks to be a scorpion bite with that we come to this end uh, hopefully your exam uh, was wonderful for all those people uh, who has given uh, exam i uh, wish you all a very best of luck So this is a banana sign. The first question of a direct question, a radiological direct question. Banana sign on antenatal ultrasound is seen in. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. So welcome to the radiology recall of INICT May 2023. And congratulations to all of you who attempted this exam, even after giving NEET PG. I'm sure if you get a good rank and you get into one of the aims, your life will change. AIMS uh, and all the AIMS that have built up now have really good infrastructure and also really good uh, academic programs. So in today's uh, recall session, I'll try to quickly cover all the important radiologic, radiologic questions that were asked. And uh, the radiology questions were pretty easy. 
uh, standard uh, from previous questions that have been asked. So the first question that I'm going to discuss is the banana sign uh, on antenatal ultrasound. Now, this was a direct radiology question that was asked. And so the options were uh, spina bifida, omphalocele, uh, Down syndrome, and congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, so I don't know whether the image was given or not, but this is the banana sign image uh, that is there. Okay, this is how the banana sign looks. And the answer to this question is a spina bifida, right? Now, why does spina bifida has a banana sign? So spina bifida uh, is a type of spinal dysraphism and is associated in a lot of scenarios with the carry malformation in which there is a shallow posterior fossa. Now, the shallow posterior fossa leads to descent of the cerebellum and the vermis into the spinal cord. And that is what is actually known as a carry malformation. And because of that descent, the cerebellum wraps around the cerebellum. This is the cerebellum. It wraps around the brain stem. Now, which, is, which part of the brain is the brain stem? This is the brain stem, the blue colored part. So it wraps around the brain stem because of the shallow posterior fossa and gives an appearance of a banana. So this is the banana sign that is seen in carry malformations or spina bifida. Now, another important sign that is seen in uh, carry malformation is a lemon sign on ultrasound. And these two are important uh, signs on antenatal ultrasound. So remember, if there is a pregnant female who has come up for level 2 scan, in those patients, you will see these lemon sign and banana sign, not, on, uh, not in an infant who has a carry malformation. Okay? It is seen on antenatal ultrasound. And what does lemon sign mean? So lemon sign is this pinching of the frontal calvaria. So this is the skull. This is the frontal bone. And this posteriorly is the occipital bone. Right? So lemon sign is this pinching of the frontal calvaria due to a shallow posterior fossa. Right? So shallow posterior fossa descends down the cerebellum. And in response to that, the frontal calvaria gets pinched. This is known as the lemon sign. Okay, now moving on to the second question. This was also an image-based question, a direct radiology question. Which variant of gallbladder is shown in the image? So I think this was the type of uh, image that was given. I'm not really sure. But uh, the answer to this question is a Phrygian cap. So it is a normal variant of a gallbladder. Right? It is not any pathology. Basically, the fundus of the gallbladder wraps around its body. So it's like a Phrygian cap. Like this is a type of cap that is worn by clown. So a Phrygian cap gallbladder uh, is a normal variant. Uh, just a pointer that it does not, it is not a pre-malignant condition. It is just a variant. It does not predispose to GBCA. Now other options for a duplicated gallbladder. So in a duplicated GB, you will find two GBs. It is a rare condition, but I have seen one case during my MD. It is a rare condition. You will see two separate GBs. GBs, right? A GB polyp. Now, a lot of students can confuse this uh, indentation. Okay, this indentation with the GB polyp, right? But, uh, you know, GB polyp is a little rounded uh, structure and it has internal vascularity within. And if you're given this kind of image and you're asked a variant of gallbladder, so the answer would be a uh, Phrygian cap. A GB polyp is a pathology. It is not a variant. Uh, now, what is a Mercedes-Benz sign? So, first of all, Mercedes-Benz sign is not seen on uh, ultrasound. Mercedes-Benz sign is seen in gallbladder stones on X-ray. Okay, it is an X-ray sign of gallbladder because of the entrapped air within the gallbladder stone in the shape of the Mercedes-Benz logo. So, that gives a Mercedes-Benz sign. It is a sign seen on uh, abdominal X-ray. Now, coming on to the next question, uh, identify the MRCP findings. So, first of all, a lot of students, uh, for the students who don't know, this is an MRCP image. MRCP image, the bile appears white and any filling defects within will appear as black. Okay. So, just a brief anatomy recall. This is the, this hole is the biliary system. This hole is the biliary system. Right. And this right here, this thin white line, this is the pancreatic duct. And what is this structure, this white, white structure? This is the stomach bubble. This is the stomach, stomach fundus with the uh, contents within. Now, in the biliary system, this part of the biliary system is the CBD. This is the CBD. 
this part above the cystic duct, this is the CHT. And what do we see here? We see in the CBD, there are these multiple black, 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 black things. These black, 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 black things. What do we call them? We call them signal voids. We call them signal voids. And in MRCP, they represent stones. They represent stones in the uh, in the within the CBD. So at MBBS level, remember the most common pathology that you will be given in an exam on an MRCP will be cholidocolithiasis only. Okay, at your level, you won't be asked other pathologies like strictures or or uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis or cholidocolysis or that sort of questions. The most common question at your level on an MRCP would be a cholidocolithiasis. So the answer here is a cholidocolithiasis because we see multiple signal voids within a dilated CBD. And this is an MRCP image. Now in acute cholecystitis, remember the investigation of choice for that is an ultrasound and not an MRCP. And you will see a, a, a gallbladder with thickened walls, pericholecystic fluid, and a stone within the lumen. So these are the three pointers which suggest acute cholecystitis ultrasound features. Now pancreatic duct stones, how will they look? They will first be present in the pancreatic duct. So they will be present in this area in the pancreatic duct. And if there are stones in the pancreatic duct, the pancreatic duct will be dilated. So what will typically be appearance of a pancreatic duct stones? There will be a dilated pancreatic duct with these black, 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 black signal voids within. Now, this is seen in cases of chronic pancreatitis in which the pancreatic duct stones causes obstruction and dilatation of the pancreatic duct. Now, cholangitis, cholangitis is a clinical diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis in which there is a biliary obstruction. and Secondarily, there is an infection uh, which causes infection of the biliary system. That is what is cholangitis. And for that also we do an ultrasound. We do an ultrasound or a CT or an MRCP to see the cause of obstruction. So cholangitis is mainly a clinical diagnosis. This MRCP in this case shows cholidocolithiasis. Okay. Now we move on to the next question. Uh, multiple fractures and painful bony lytic lesions. And this was the X-ray pelvis that was given. So what do we see here? First, we see that it is a child. It is a skeletally immature child. And we see this ground glass lesions, these ground glass lesions involving the proximal femur, This, these whole lesions. Okay. So these are typical. What is this? This is a shepherd crook deformity. Shepherd crook deformity. I have already told you about this in our class on musculoskeletal tumors as well as we also discussed this during the INI recall, uh, the INI uh, fast track sessions. And if you have multiple of multiple such lesions, so we are dealing with the polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, right? Fib polyostotic fibrous dysplasia we are dealing with. And if there are associated skin lesions, now though some of the students are saying that it had specifically said light brown colored uh, chest macules. Okay, so they, in that case, represents cafe ole spots, right? Cafe ole spots. And if you have this picture of polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, plus cafe ole spots and also precocious puberty, precocious puberty, then you are dealing with what? You are dealing with, yes, McCune Albright syndrome. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, there was another question in which a direct chest X-ray of the patient was given. It was a trauma setting. Uh, and the question had asked just ki, what are the, which are the ribs that are fractured? So it was a typical radiological uh, question asking you, uh, asking you basically, how do you count ribs? Right? So you always count ribs, remember, anterior to posterior. So this is the first rib. Okay. So this is the first rib. This is the second rib. And you see that these two ribs show very well cortical continuity. So what do you have to see when you are counting ribs and seeing rib fractures? You are seeing cortical continuity. Okay. So this will be the rib one. You are seeing the normal cortical continuity. The second rib, the third rib, 
This is the fourth rib. Again, you see very well cortical continuity. But in this fifth rib, okay, this is the fifth rib. You see that the cortex is broken here. At this point, you see that there is cortical breach. So what is the buzzword for rib fractures? It is cortical breach. Now remember this word for all kinds of fractures, whether it's calcaneum long bone fractures, fractures, subtle fractures show cortical breach. Okay. Now in the, so we have a fracture of fifth rib. Can we trace the sixth rib? This is the sixth rib, right? We trace it anterior to posterior. Here we see a fracture. So this is a fracture of sixth rib. So can we trace the seventh rib? We see that there is this cortical discontinuity or cortical breach at this level. So there is fracture of seventh rib as well. So basically, there are fractures of 5th, 6th and 7th rib in this question. Right? Now, we move on to the next question. So, patient presents with dysuria, uh, fatigue and backache. X-ray abdomen is shown below. What could be the like diagnosis? So, uh, backache is... Uh, so, this is a typical pre clinical presentation uh, of, let's say, a, a hyperparathyroidism. So, what is, clinic, uh, what is typically called as a... Uh, go on, uh, moan, and uh, low mood. So basically, low mood, uh, uh, backache, or bony lesions, bone pain, and uh, ut recurrent UTIs. These are uh, features of uh, hypercalcemia in general. And what is this X ray showing? It is showing medullary nephrocalcinosis. Medullary nephrocalcinosis. Right, so there is increased serum calcium, and in these options, what can be the cause of that? Yes, the answer here is a parathyroid adenoma, which causes backache due to backache. In that case, is due to brown tumors. Right, fatigue is due to hypercalcemia, and dysuria is due to recurrent UTI secondary to. Secondary to renal stones. Okay, so medullary nephrocalcinosis is an important uh, important spotter in exams, both for UG as well as PG, I would say. And the answer here is a parathyroid adenoma. Okay, now uh, another radiology question, typical radiology questions of breast imaging. What are the advantages? All of the all of our uh, advantages of ultrasound over mammography, except so. Let's just read the question uh, options. First, uh, uh, non-palpable lesions can be diagnosed on ultrasound and not on mammography. Second, helpful, ultrasound is helpful in image-guided biopsy and mammography is not. So both ultrasound and mammography <coughs> uh, are helpful uh, in image-guided biopsy. So it's not a typical advantage of one over another. Useful in young females with dense breast. Yes, it is a correct option. Can differentiate solid and cystic lesion? Yes, it is a correct option. Now, uh, what are the advantages of ultrasound over mammography? All of true, all of these are advantages except. So, is ultrasound advantages over mammography in image-guided biopsy? Yes, although mammography and ultrasound both are used in image guidance, but ultrasound is much more commonly used and ultrasound is much more easily used for image guidance because you can directly visualize the mass and change the needle position. So this option is also correct. Okay, now let's just read the first option again. A non-palpable lesion can be diagnosed on ultrasound and not on mammography. No, this is, a, uh, this is not an advantage of ultrasound over mammography. So if there is a non-palpable lesion, you cannot palpate it. So either whether you go for an ultrasound or whether you go for a mammography is dependent on the age of the patient. So for even non-palpable lesions, if the age is more than 40 years, you will go for a mammography. And if it is less than 40 years, you will still go for an ultrasound. Okay, so it is not typically an advantage of one modality over other. Okay. Now, let's go on to the next question, which of the following is a sign of malignant transformation of tumor shown in the x-ray. So what is the tumor that is shown? So I think all of you know the answer to this. This is an osteochondroma. This is an osteochondroma, also known as exostosis. Okay, also known as exostosis. So it's typically saying, what are the signs of malignant transformation? 
So uh, increase in cartilage and scab thickness more than two centimeter. Yes, it is a correct option. So some say it's 1.5, some say two, but this is a correct option. Normally it grows away from the joint, but if it grows towards the joint, it is a sign of malignant transformation, not really. Okay, bone marrow continuity in the tumor and the parent bone. So this is a sign, this is a characteristic feature of osteochondroma. You have to see it to call it osteochondroma. It is not a sign of malignant transformation. Developmental abnormality that ceases to grow beyond skeletal maturity. Yes, osteochondromas uh, do not grow beyond skeletal maturity. And uh, so stopping stop uh, growth stoppage of growth beyond skeletal maturity is not a sign of malignant transformation so the answer here is uh, one right now uh, i have one more question for you so there was a question on thymoma there was a question on thymoma as well and i think it will be covered in surgery uh, as well and uh, the options had mentioned that which of the following uh, are true for thymoma and so one of the options were it is the most common posterior mediastinal mass. So remember, thymoma is an anterior mediastinal mass. It is an anterior mediastinal mass. And in fact, anterior mediastinal masses have very less differentials. You can remember it by the mnemonic 40s. Okay, thymoma, teratoma, thyroid. So basically, uh, mediastinal thyroid and terrible lymphoma terrible lymphoma so these are the four differentials of an anterior mediastinal mass and thymoma is not a posterior mediastinal mass remember now thymoma is the most common uh, primary neoplasm of the thymus be it uh, among both malignant and benign it is the most common primary neoplasm of the thymus so this was the correct option and another option was that investigation of choice for uh, thymoma is x-ray no it is a contrast enhanced ct the investigation of choice is a contrast enhanced CT. And what are the clinical features? Since it is in an anterior mediastinum, it is an anterior mediastinum, it will not cause dysphagia. It will not cause dysphagia. I think one of the options had mentioned dysphagia. So remember, it will not cause dysphagia. It causes SVC syndrome. Okay. Because it compresses on the SVC and the brachiocephalic vein. So this was uh, all about the radiology recall uh, from this year's uh, May I and I CT. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, everyone. We are over here to discuss the INICET recall questions with the uh, which has which have come from the subject of pediatrics. I am Dr. Dipali Gupta. So these questions are basically based on the recall. Some might be erroneous. Please excuse me for that. Whatever recall we have got, we are going to discuss on the basis of that. Right? Okay, so. The first question which came to me was, according to Nadas criteria, which of the following was a minor criteria? And this had multiple choices in the form of A, B, A, B, C or A and C like that. So what options did I get was whether it is soft S2, low blood pressure, diastolic murmur, systolic and systolic murmur of grade 3. So if we see what is the NADAS criteria, NADAS criteria are used for the diagnosis of congenital heart defects. And if we go back to our learning, we know that there are major criteria and minor criteria. There are four major criteria and five minor criteria. Presence of any one major or presence of two minor indicates the existence of congenital heart defects. 
and they are usually to be used in children less than five years of age because after five years of age, the acquired heart disease also creep in and namely your rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. So therefore, they are more applicable or more uh, consistent when they are used, the NADAS criteria are used for the diagnosis of congenital heart defects in children less than five years of age. So let us look at what are the major and what are the minor criteria. So in the major criteria, we have systolic murmur grade three or more in intensity. We have any grade of diastolic murmur and the presence of CCF or the presence of cyanosis. These are the four major criteria I was talking to you about. And then in the minor criteria, we have systolic murmur less than grade 3 in intensity. So if grade 3 is written, it comes in the major criteria. Less than grade 3 comes in minor criteria. Diastolic murmur of any grade has already come in major criteria. So in the minor criteria, we have the abnormal second heart sound. In fact, this is such a typical diagnostic feature of heart diseases in children. Any problem, any abnormality in second heart sound bound to have congenital heart defect. But then since its interpretation is largely subjective, depends on the hearing equity of the listener, of the observer, therefore it is placed in the minor criteria. Abnormal ECG, abnormal chest x-ray and abnormal blood pressure. So all these co would come in minor criteria. So if we revisit the question, let us see Soft S2, of course, soft S2 is an abnormal second heart sound. So this is, of course, one of the minor criteria. Then, okay, just a minute. So soft S2, yes, this is one of the minor criteria. Then low BP, yes, this is also the minor criteria. Diastolic murmur of any grade is definitely a major criteria. And systolic grade 3 murmur or systolic murmur of grade 3 or more is again a major criteria. So the correct option would be the options having soft S2 and low BP. So probably in our question, the correct answer would be A plus B or both. Let, us, let me write both A, B. Right. So whatever the case may be, the question might be having these same choices at different uh, options so that you could have answered very easily. A sort of easy question to begin with. Then let us start with the, let us move on to the next question. And that is history of four-year-old boy with Kawasaki disease. What is the management? Of course, they have given the snapshots, the pictures of the cardinal features of Kawasaki disease. One is your strawberry tongue, other is the buse lines, which is usually seen during conval convalescence in Kawasaki disease. And third is the rash, the pleomorphic or the polymorphic rash seen in Kawasaki disease. So what do you uh, go, uh, give for treatment? Of course, the first and the foremost is IVIG. In recall, I was also getting uh, something that was written about myocardial infarction also. So anyways, IVIG has to be given. That is first and the foremost. So if there was one choice only and there were no combination of choices given in the final options, then we will definitely go for IVIG. But let me tell you, aspirin is also given. Initially, it is given at a higher dose. And then for, for its anti-inflammatory uh, anti action and then later on it is tapered to lower doses and continued for a longer period. So let us look what is Kawasaki disease all about. So first of all, you should know that fever lasting for at least five days and then presence of any four of the following conditions. So what are the following conditions? Bilateral non purulent conjunctivitis, then changes of mucosa of the oropharynx, that is strawberry tongue, which we just saw, and injection of the pharynx, then changes of the peripheral extremities like uh, bipedal edema or erythema of the hands or feet. And as we know, in the convalescent stage, we may see desquamation. The typical areas where we see desquamation is the perioral and the perianal desquamation, but they are seen in the convales convalescent phase and not in the acute stages. And of course, as I was telling you, polymorphous rash, but never, never a vesicular rash. Uh, that should be, that is one of the criteria. And of course, cervical lymphadenopathy, at least one node should be 1.5 centimeters and usually it is seen unilaterally. Apart from this, illness not explained by any other disease process and buse lines as seen in the convalescent phase. 
and the basic pathophys pathophysiology of Kawasaki disease is the necrotizing vasculitis of the medium-sized vessels. So that has to be kept in mind. And the most dreaded complication, as we know, is the giant coronary artery aneurysms, which are responsible for MI. You know, there are only two causes of myocardial infection, uh, myocardial infarction in children. One is Kawasaki disease because of the development of giant coronary artery aneurysms. And second is Alkapa, anomalous origin of left coronary artery. So these are two causes of MI in children. Otherwise, MI, as you know, does not occur in children. So because of this dreaded complication of giant coronary artery aneurysms, we start the child on IVIG to halt the immunological attack and of course the inflammatory condition which have already developed to reverse that we have to give an anti-inflammatory drug in form of aspirin right so that is with uh, that is what had to be done so here we would go for IVIG as the first and the foremost therapy to be used in the treatment of Kawasaki disease. And as I was telling you, if there would have been multiple options, then A and B both would have been the correct answer. Right. Okay. Then next is uh, treatment we have already done. As I was telling you, aspirin is initially given at the dose of 75 to 80 mg per kg till the child becomes afebrile. And then, of course, low dose aspirin is continued for a few weeks for its antiplatelet activity. And as we already know, in Kawasaki, we get to see thrombocytosis. Now, a bit of, you know, I would tell you something which is just out of the box. Thrombocytopenia is also seen in Kawasaki disease. However, thrombocytosis is the classic manifestation. But if thrombocytopenia is there, remember this child has a very, very high risk of developing giant coronary artery aneurysm. So I had written a paper on this thrombocytopenia in Kawasaki disease. You can check it out on PubMed. It is there. Yes, it is a finding in Kawasaki disease, but the classic learning is always thrombocytosis. So keep that in mind. So that has to be uh, taken care of. Then let us come to the next question. What is the complication caused by organism uh, associated with the given image? So this is a typical slab cheek appearance, which was given. And we all know this. We are talking about erythema infectiosum, also known as the fifth disease caused by none other than dreaded parovirus B19, right? So parovirus B19 causes uh, this uh, slab cheek appearance, uh, erythema infectiosum, as it is called. And of course, it is also responsible for the aplastic crisis, very commonly seen in children having chronic hemolytic anemias, something like sickle cell anemia or pyruvate kinase deficiency or hereditary spherocytosis. So in these conditions, parovirus B19 is supposed to cause sudden drop in hemoglobin along with reticulocytopenia because this is aplastic crisis and there is total halt in the manufacture of RBCs. And these children would come up with additional symptoms of because there is lower hemoglobin, the hemoglobin has dropped drastically. So they may develop severe anemia, pallor, fatigue, and you know palpitations because of the decrease in hemoglobin. So this is nothing but the answer was pure red cell aplasia over here because of the aplastic crisis caused by parovirus B19, which also gives rise to a slap cheek appearance. So this is the typical erythema infectiosum that has been discussed over here, usually seen in the age group of 5 to 15 years of age. And it is usually the prodromal symptoms are of low-grade viral infection. And the typical appearance of erythematous flushing of the face is referred to as slap cheek appearance. And the rash then starting from the face uh, spreads rapidly to the trunk and proximal extremities as a diffuse erythematous macular rash that rapidly undergoes a central clearing. This is the hallmark of the rash of erythema infectiosum. You have to remember it, that it goes central clear, it undergoes central clearing to give it a lacy or a reticulated pattern. The rash gradually fades over the coming one to three week period and this is typically known as the fifth disease caused by parovirus B19, right? 
Then there was a very interesting question, really like this question, and that was a DPT has been given to child since they have written DPT. So most probably they are referring to whole cell DPT. So whole cell DPT or DPT as we call it is given to a child at six weeks following which the child develops inconsolable crying. At 10 weeks, what would be the next step? Right, so do we give DPT again? Do we give DT? That means omit the pertussis part. We don't give DPT at all or we skip a month and then give DPT after one month. So this was these were the options which were given to me on recall. So if you see this question, this was a very straightforward question. You, I'm sure many of you must have got it right. So please remember uh, persistent crying or inconsolable crying for three hours or maybe hypotensive, hyporesponsive episodes, right? And a high grade fever of more than 40.5 degrees centigrade. This, these are not contraindications for DPT vaccination. And it is usually seen that if these episodes are seen with the first DPT vaccination, and if you give DPT again, usually these episodes would not occur. So therefore in this, the correct answer would be we have to give DPT to this child, right? So there is no option. There is no option of not giving DPT. You will continue with whole cell DPT. It is not a contraindication. So obviously the next question which arises, ma'am, what are the contraindications? So there are two main contraindications. One is if the child has history of anaphylaxis, then definitely next time DPT is not to be given. This has to be kept in mind. And this actually applies with every vaccine. If the vaccine has to be given in multiple dosages and with the first dose, the anaphylactic reaction has occurred, you are not supposed to repeat the vaccine, right? So there would be some adjuvant or some component of the vaccine which is causing anaphylaxis in this child. And obviously, this child would have the repeat episode if you give it again. So that is one contraindication you have to keep in mind. No DPT. That means you can't even give DT in this case. So that has to be, you know, uh, kept in mind. Then the second contraindication given over here is the development of encephalopathy in the coming seven days following the previous DPT vaccination. So in this case, what are we supposed to do is the next time we omit the pertussis component and we will give DT. So that is what is, you know, uh, as uh, you prescribed or as detailed by Indian Academy of Pediatrics in their guidelines. It is this what we have to follow that in case of with a history of encephalopathy, just a minute, with a history of encephalopathy following vaccination, the any pertussis vaccine is contraindicated and only DT can be given. So that is how you are going to approach this question. And of course, as I was telling you, events such as persistent inconsolable crying for three hours duration or hyperpyrexia of more than 40.5 degrees centigrade or HHHE, HHE, you know this, hypotensive, hyporesponsive episodes occurring within 48 hours of DPT vaccination. And of course, the fourth one also, that if seizures occur with or without fever, with Within 72 hours of vaccination, they are just considered as precautions for further administration of DPT and they are not considered contraindication. This should be very clear. Of course, there is one relative contraindication and that is... Uh, progressive or uh, evolving neurological illness. So that is a relative contraindication to the even the first dose of DPT vaccination. However, DPT can be safely given in children with stable neurological disorders. Again, for them, this is not even a relative contraindication, not even an absolute contraindication. For stable neurological disorder, it can be given. And for evolving a neurological disorder, of course, it's a relative contraindication as far as the first dose of DPT is concerned. So we have to weigh the risk and benefit and then take a decision accordingly. So I hope this was a very nice question and most of you would have got it right. Then again, a very sketchy question that came my, my way was child with three days of vomiting, watery diarrhea presented with altered sensorium. Possible diagnosis include. So what I was told was these were multiple choice questions. That, that means the final answer was something like A, B or A, B and C or A and and see whatever the combination would have been. So what do we consider in this case? So most likely here, if you see 
since the child had watery diarrhea and not bloody diarrhea and the duration is also very short. So HUS is definitely not the option over here to be considered. So here, severe dehydration, yes, you know that severe dehydration, following uh, vomiting and loose stools, the child can go into severe dehydration and that is one of the cause for altered sensorium. Hyponatremia is very, very well recorded to be the cause of altered sensorium in children presenting to you with acute gastroenteritis. And of course, cerebral venous thrombosis, this usually follows a bout of dehydration, especially in children who have some underlying disorders which have a, you know, prothrombotic state existing in along with it. So it's something like nephrotic syndrome. So tomorrow, if a child with nephrotic syndrome and, you know, has a bout of acute gastroenteritis, this is one complication that we are supposed to consider. For that mat matter, even iron deficiency anemia. Why iron deficiency anemia? Because iron deficiency anemia usually also has uh, increased number of platelets. So thrombocytosis is there. You look up any uh, blood picture of severe iron deficiency anemia, the thrombocytes, that means the platelets are in increased number, that's a prothrombotic state. So even that is known to cause, uh, you know, cerebral venous thrombosis, especially if complicated by a bout of acute gastroenteritis. So for me, all these three options stand corrected. So probably the option where all the three barring HUS would have been the answer, right? Of course, I stand corrected if there was any other options or any other form of question was framed, you know, then all my apologies to you. Then let us move on to the next question. The delivery procedure to be done in a baby delivered through meconium stain liquor. So lots of evolutions have taken place in the management of meconium stain liquor baby, you know, uh, right from the starting of NRP, uh, this thing revisions we have been we have been witnessing that usually when I was doing my post graduation we used to do this that before delivery of anterior shoulder we used to suction the mouth and the nose you know right that means the rest of the body is still in the vaginal cavity and you know we used to go there the uh, obstetrician used to halt the process of extracting out the baby and we used to do the delivery uh, we used to do the uh, suction of mouth and nose but nowadays this is nowadays in fact for the past so many years I think the last revision that is in 2015 now the latest has come in 2021 NRP but the before this in 2015 itself or maybe before that it was made amply clear that the uh, suction intrapartum. This was known as intrapartum suctioning. So intrapartum suctioning does not confer much benefit in the survival of the child or in preventing the morbidity of the child. So you better don't do it. So we had stopped doing uh, intrapartum suctioning, right? So this is definitely not to be done. Again, this was, let me tell you, M means this was a, again a multiple choice answer. Multiple choice means the final answer was in the form of A, B, A, B or maybe A, B, C, or maybe AD, different combinations, right? So let us see, at least this is not the correct option. Then positive pressure ventilation in non-vigorous child after the initial steps, of course, this is correct. Many of you would say, ma'am, we have been told that positive pressure ventilation is contraindicated in meconium stain like our babies. No, it is not. Nowadays, for that matter, in 2015 itself, they had given in the NRP revision that uh, neonatal resuscitation protocol revision that positive pressure ventilation can be done in a non-vigorous baby, of course, after doing the suctioning. Then gentle suctioning of a vigorous baby, of course, this is also correct. This is what you are going to do normally. And then tracheal suctioning followed by mouth suctioning, even this is not to be done nowadays. So this is again not a, a very preferred procedure. So therefore, even this is out. Initially, we used to do this tracheal suctioning, the usual steps initially. Initially means in the past, uh, what we used to do was since bag and mask was contraindicated, positive 
pressure ventilation through bag and mask was contraindicated. So we used to intubate the baby and do the tracheal suctioning and then, you know, uh, do the bag and tube ventilation. But nowadays, tracheal suctioning is also not required. So definitely the correct would be the B and C option. So uh, if any answer was there where the B and C option was there, uh, was uh, the combination, then definitely that uh, option is right in this question. I hope I have made myself clear. Then coming to the next, this was a very easy question that matched the following. We know this Edward syndrome. E stands for Edward and E stands for trisomy 18. So we will match it like this. Then Patau syndrome. You know, Patau is, how do you remember? T is for 13 over here. So you have to remember Patau is trisomy 13. Huntington's we all know is trinucleotide repeat disorder and of course in sickle cell anemia there at beta 6 uh, position there is you know the interchange of glutam glutamic acid with valine right of the glo the beta globin chain so we know this that what renders the uh, RBC sickle shaped right so this is the abnormal uh, formation of the hemoglobin so therefore this was a very very easy question and I hope everybody would have got this correct so the pediatric question what I feel was sort of moderate to easy that is it right okay then next is causes of high output cardiac failure I don't know I can also discuss this we already know this is high output this is high output and this is also high output so definitely the answer becomes core pulmonale right so this is right ventricular failure although this must have been nicely discussed in the medicine portion also okay then iron profile and iron deficiency anemia are all so which which were the iron which what was there in the iron profile since we see lots of iron deficiency anemia and we get the iron studies done so definitely this ha would have been discussed by the other faculty also but still i have taken it let us see so there were multiple choices in this and if you see everything is correct because iron deficiency anemia entails low body iron so definitely the storage form of iron is ferritin so decreased ferritin is there serum iron again would be reflective of the total body iron if that is going to be decreased transferrin you know is a you know transport protein for iron so definitely if the total body iron is less so it will be less bound to the iron and therefore it will be less saturated that is the reason and increased TIBC you know this is kind of hungry TIBC you know for trans uh, for iron so therefore the TIBC is going to be increased we know this already so all the options were correct and any option in which A, B, C and D was there would be the correct this thing right okay then maximum incubation period we have we know this also uh, for chicken pox if you remember is 10 to 21 days for hepatitis a we again know that this would be around 50 days the maximum incubation period syphilis it is 90 days and for sars would be 10 days right so i've again written over here for you so sars would be 2 to 14 days chicken pox is 10 to 21 days hepatitis a is 10 to 50 days and syphilis is 10 to 90 days so this is again a, this was again a very easy question right so this is it about the questions which had come from the section of pediatrics do feel free to connect with me at the Allen Next app if there was any other question of pediatrics which we have not covered. Thank you. Today, I'm discussing the gynae recall questions of INICET May 2023 session. So this we have prepared from the students who have given the exam. So I tried my best to compile the questions with the in the correct form, the way it has come in the exam with the all four options. Okay, so let us start with the first question. Vaginal discharge, a female presented with vaginal discharge. The pH was acidic. It is non-itchy, yellowish discoloration. Lactobacillus count is normal. And what is the diagnosis? I think 
uh, in the question, because some of the students have sent me the question, uh, they have written a uh, female is using the oral contraceptives. Okay. So I will discuss in both ways. Now, the options given to me are bacterial vaginosis, chlamydia, excessive normal discharge, or candida. Number one, we will try to rule out options one after the other. Okay. So, first option given to me in this question is bacterial vaginosis. And bacterial vaginosis is a condition. So, normal flora of the vagina, as all of you know, is daughterlane bacillus, which grows with the estrogen content. So, this bacillus is present in abundance in the reproductive years of life because it breaks down the glycogen content into lactic acid. So, making the pH of vagina acidic that inhibits the growth of the pathogens. So, bacterial vaginosis is the first situation given to me here. In bacterial vaginosis, the normal lactobacillus is replaced by Gardenella vaginalis or Haemophilus. or mycoplasma and the pH changes to alkaline. So, and here there is a fishy odor or foul smelling vaginal discharge. So, this option is ruled out because here, the pH given in the question is acidic pH, okay, which rules out bacterial vaginosis because the pH in bacterial vaginosis is more than 4.5, that is towards alkaline. Number two, there is always a fishy odor or foul smelling discharge. Number three, whiff test is positive. So, nothing is given in this question. So, bacterial vaginosis is already ruled out. Now, one thing I want to tell you here is vaginitis, which is a cause of vaginal discharge. The main causative agents we talk about is trichomoniasis, candidiasis, and bacterial vaginosis. When we talk about cervicitis, cervicitis, there is gonorrhea infection and there is chlamydia infection. So, they reside in the endocervix whenever the body resistance is reduced or there is any instrumentation. They can gain entry to the upper genital tract of the female and can lead to PID, pelvic inflammatory condition, which is mostly the PID causative agents are sexually transmitted and when they gain access to uterus causes endometritis to the fallopian tube salpingitis and to the ovaries ophritis. Okay. Number three is excessive normal discharge. Number four is candida. In candida, there is thick curdy white vaginal discharge. Number two, in candida, Vaginal discharge is always present and itching is a very prominent symptom. So, candida is also ruled out in this situation. So, the answer is excessive normal discharge whenever due to any physiological condition, the secretions from the endocervical glands is increased. That leads to non-itchy discharge and the pH of the re vagina remains acidic. This condition can be called as licoria, which is a physiological discharge. Okay. Physiological discharge. Okay. The point in favor of this excessive normal discharge or licoria is the pH is maintained acidic and the discharge is non-itchy and there is no foul smelling. Fine. So, I hope it is clear to all of you. Now, in trichomoniasis, 
remember the most prominent symptom is itching and there is strawberry spots in vagina there is greenish vaginal discharge causative agent is a protozoa which is a flagellated microorganism and drug of choice is metronidazole number 2 when it is candida itching itching is present and there is thick curdy white vaginal discharge thick curdy white vaginal discharge and the drug is antifungal that is fluconazole about bacterial vaginosis i have told you that itching is absent but there is a foul smelling vaginal discharge clu cells are positive on the saline microscopy and in this case ph is more than 4.5 whiff test is positive and amsels criteria is positive amsels criteria is positive and it is not std the drug of choice is metronidazole fine now next question in this list is a pregnant women with a known history of fibroid uterus so there is already a lady she is already having fibroid and now she is pregnant during pregnancy she comes with acute pain abdomen fever and increased leukocytosis what is your probable diagnosis so this is very very clear and simple question uh, even the final year mbba student can answer this question because it is very very clear cut clinical history whenever there is a female with fibroid and she is pregnant okay and she comes with acute pain abdomen plus there is history of fever there is tlc count which is raised so in this case my first differential diagnosis will be red degeneration of fibroid if suppose there is no history of fibroid given and the female is pregnant and she comes with an acute pain abdomen we have to rule out the surgical emergencies as well so if i talk about the gynae then i my first diagnosis in that case when the history of fibroid is not given i will think of an abruptio placentae because abruptio is more common than red degeneration okay second i will make a diagnosis of red degeneration of fibroid third will be twisted ovarian cyst and i have to rule out with a history and examination the possibility of acute appendicitis or there is any obstruction in the gut so surgical emergency should also be ruled out but this is a very very clear cut and straight forward question where a female is having fibroid she is pregnant and she comes with an acute pain abdomen with leukocytosis with fever so my investigation of choice will be ultrasound now why does the red degeneration of fibroid occurs red degeneration of fibroid occurs because of thrombosis in the veins or there is aseptic necrosis so always remember there is another question which always they ask what is the management of red degeneration of fibroid in pregnancy so management friends is conservative management no surgery never we go for surgery why because we are not going to gain anything we have to just admit the patient take the consent start the iv fluids always admit your patient take the high risk consent start iv fluids give 
एनल जेसिक्स योर पेशेंट विल बी एब्सोल्यूटली फाइन दिस मैनेजमेंट इज कॉल्ड एज कंजर्वेटिव मैनेजमेंट सो फॉर एक्यूट रेड डी जनरेशन ऑफ फाइब्रॉइड द मैनेजमेंट इज कंजर्वेटिव मैनेजमेंट एंड देयर इज no surgical management no where the surgery is recommended okay so in this case the answer will be red degeneration a uh, twisted or torsion of ovarian cyst the history will be something different okay and infection is again not the presentation like this and not even the preterm labor pains because we are not able to explain why the fibroid is leading to all these problems so my diagnosis if there is a clear cut history with an investigation report is given so i am going to make a diagnosis of red degeneration of fibroid okay had it been fibroid not given in the history i would have thought of twisted ovarian cysts or appendicitis or other surgical emergencies okay so remember two things clear cut history suggestive of red degeneration of fibroid number 2 the management is a conservative management now why we don't want to do surgery because we do not gain anything in this situation and number 2 when there is a pregnancy the anatomy is very much distorted and this uterus uh, it is a very very vascular organ because it is receiving the blood supply from the uterine artery at term pregnancy the blood supply at the level or blood flow from the uterine artery is 750 ml per minute which is a huge amount of blood flow plus there is always an anastomosis from the ovarian artery so it is very very vascular organ fine now next question is a 26 year old female came with a history of infertility for 6 hours 6 years infertility for 6 years bmi uh, is 30 kilogram per meter square with an excessive facial hair growth a young female with infertility and bmi is given plus there is excessive facial hair growth fine so this history gives me a clue towards polycystic ovarian syndrome because uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome although the very common presentation if it is an unmarried female then the common presentation is the uh, you know like menstrual disturbances in the form of oligomenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea or infertility when there is a beginning of the pcod the cycles may be heavy cycles because there is high levels of estrogen and the protective Uh, or the anti estrogen like uh, progesterone is you know like deficient so most important cause of an ovulation with menstrual disturbances and with increased androgen that the presentation is hirsutism where there is increased facial hair growth okay then it is mostly pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome provided the other causes of hirsutism you have ruled out what are the other causes of hirsutism is congenital adrenal hyperplasia that is late onset late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia late onset then there can be androgen producing or virilizing ovarian tumors in virilizing ovarian tumors there will be a feature of clitoromegaly in cases of late onset of congenital adrenal hyperplasia there is prepubertal prepubertal hirsutis okay prepubertal hirsutis then there can be there can be uh, the adrenal tumor which is androgen producing so that is what is a differential diagnosis of pcos so most common is pcos provided other causes of hirsutism you have ruled out that is congenital adrenal hyperplasia late onset virilizing ovarian tumors and uh, androgen producing adrenal tumors now in this question they are not asking much about the pcos they are asking about the management of such a case 
always remember in the previous INICET exam, okay, uh, the topics are the same, but the framing of question may be slightly different. So one thing important you have to remember in PCOS is a Rotterdam criteria. In the Rotterdam criteria, there is there is hyperandrogenism that is increased androgens that is clinical appearance. Clinical appearance is uh, increase in the facial hair growth. There is acne. There is temporal balding. That is what is the presentation of anti-androgenous clinically or there is a lab finding which is suggested that androgen levels are high. Number two, there is an ovulation leading to menstrual disturbances. Menstrual disturbances like oligomenorrhea, hypomenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, and later on there is infertility. Then there can be ultrasound widening, which is showing polycystic ovaries. This is Rotterdam criteria. So when we talk about the management, just remember that in this case, there is estrogen, which is high. There is androgen, which is high. There is increase in the insulin resistance and there is an ovulation plus there is a progesterone deficiency. So remember this uh, hormonal pathology in PCOS, there is a vicious cycle which is formed. So obesity is very important feature in obesity, there is increased androgens. And remember, increased androgens, you know, like always suppresses the ovarian function. So first step in management is always weight reduction in obese patient. And second line of management is that you introduce the drugs. So drugs is according to the symptoms in this question they have asked that what will be your management so i will just read out the options weight reduction metformin ovulation induction with clomiphen weight reduction metformin ovulation induction with gonadotropins finasteride right, metformin weight for spontaneous conception finasteride right, metformin ovulation induction now first of all Always select an option where there is weight reduction written, okay? Because that is what I said. It is a first step in managing a patient with PCOS who is towards the obesity side. So these two options we have ruled out and always my first choice is not going to be anti-androgen drugs straight away, okay? So it is weight reduction. Now what to select? Am I going to select a clomiphen citrate or am I going to select HMG, human menopausal gonadotropin? Of course, my first selection will be clomiphen citrate, although nowadays better drug than clomiphen citrate is latrozole, which is aromatase inhibitor and there is less side effects, okay? But we can give clomiphen citrate as well, okay? So... I am saying latrozole has been replacing clomiphene citrate, but in none of the options, the latrozole is given. So my answer will be weight reduction. That is the first line management or first step in management. Then metformin, which will going to act or which will correct the insulin resistance because insulin is stimulating. Insulin is stimulating the theca cell hyperplasia in the ovary and theca cells produce androgens, causing hirsutis and suppresses the ovarian function leading to an ovulation, okay? So my answer here will be weight reduction, metformin, which will keep a check on the insulin resistance and as well as the obesity levels. And because the patient wants treatment of infertility, so I am going to give ovulation induction with clomiphene citrate. Got it? Now, next is most common cause of manorrhagia in puberty. 
always remember when the female or a young girl is starting with menarche the initial cycles initial cycles are an ovulatory that means there is high levels of estrogen and lack of progesterone now what is estrogen going to do estrogen is going to cause proliferation of the proliferation of the endometrium and progesterone causes secretory changes progesterone causes secretory changes so after the levels if there is no fertilization of the ovum then the estrogen corpus luteum disintegrates estrogen progesterone level falls and normal menstruation is estrogen progesterone withdrawal bleeding and the endometrial thickness when there is progesterone present in the body the endometrial thickness is well controlled and then shedding of the endometrium is in in the controlled manner but when there is puberty time okay or premenopausal time in both the cases in puberty time the ovarian function is starting in the premenopausal female the ovarian function is ending so there is a hormonal imbalance in the reproductive time the hormone the ratio between estrogen and progesterone is maintained so the cycles are most of the females is well controlled cycles so most common cause of menorrhagia in puberty or in the pubertal girls is not endometriosis and you know like even the chances of malignancy is not very common bleeding disorder or a clotting factor deficiency is again not not the most common presentation so it is usually an ovulation because hypothalamo pituitary ovary and uterine axis is getting mature so initial cycles i said are an ovulatory where there is a thick endometrium and once the shedding occurs so it will be a heavy cycles because there is a progesterone deficiency so there is uh, protective progesterone is absent in them so you know like secretory changes and the endometrial thickness is not been there means it is not maintained so there is a heavy heavy you know like cycles because of the shedding of the thick endometrium fine now in a female next question presented to gynae opd with complaints of vaginal discharge upon further investigation clue cells were found in the microscopy okay now what are these clue cells okay bacterial vaginosis remember the vaginal discharge topic the pid the naco kit this is very very important when i was taking a session for uh, you know like a mock session for obs gynae before the inicet or after i have taken the recall sessions of neat pg you know like there is so much of focus of uh, focus on the vaginal discharge or on the naco color code kits or in the pid usually this is a very very hot topic for questions okay so what are the clue cells clue cells you know is seen in bacterial bacterial vaginosis and the causative agent most common causative agent is gardenella vagina okay so what are the clue cells clue cells are normal epithelial cells and bacteria are adherent to them normal epithelial cells of the vagina where bacteria get adherent so that is what i have been explaining in my sessions so let us see which option is matching to this okay so can you see clue cells on saline microscopy yes we can make a wet film okay now so gardenella vaginalis rods are accumulated is that the clue cells no macrophages have phagocytosed the dodderlin bacilli is that the clue cells no so it is epithelial cells studded with bacteria that is what is called as clue cells so you can see this is a saline microscopy 
this is an approximate figure to just make you understand this is a normal epithelial cells and can you see that this is a clue cell where the normal epithelial cell of vagina and it is studied with uh, the bacteria so exactly you see in saline microscopy the film like this this is just to make you understand so what is a clue cell fine now, which of the following is not the treatment of endometriosis? Well, I really doubt if it was a multiple options because in INICET, there is more than one option. So, endometriosis is the presence of endometrial tissue outside the uterine cavity. And most common site for endometriosis is ovary, where it presents as a chocolate cyst ovary. And the rare site for endometriosis is CNS or it is clean, whichever option is given to you. So in endometriosis, the most common symptom of the female, it is mostly the reproductive age group female. And usually the most common symptom of the patient is pain. And what type of pain? It is congestive dysmenorrhea. Okay. Congestive dysmenorrhea. Next is dyspareunia. When there is adhesions, when there is adhesions in the pouch of Douglas, the uterus mobility becomes restricted and there is a tenderness in the pouch of Douglas. So dyspareunia. And another important presentation is infertility. So this is a classical presentation of endometriosis pain is the most common symptom and congestive dysmenorrhea there can be a chronic pelvic pain there is dyspareunia and there is infertility there can be menorrhagia but menorrhagia is usually not the most common symptom in endometriosis usually patient presents in three forms three type of presentations is seen in endometriosis number one if your patient has presented with symptoms like pain or she has presented with infertility or her common presentation can be adenexal masses like this is the uterus, this is the ovary and there is bilateral chocolate cyst ovary. Okay, bilateral chocolate cyst ovary. Now, why there is infertility? Because uh, there is a lot of peritubal and periovarian adhesions and uterus, ovary, fimbria are entangled in adhesions. So, due to immobilization of uh, fallopian tube leads to infertility. So, fimbria get entangled. It is not able to pick up the ovum and hence infertility. So, endometriosis is hyper estrogen state and usually it is seen in a high socioeconomic status female then those who are nulliparous those who are having late marriages okay in all those females they are at risk for endometriosis one most important point you should remember is uh, endometriosis is responsible for 50 40 to 50 percent cases of unexplained infertility the cause you will find is endometriosis. So one of the important and the gold standard investigation in endometriosis, friends, is laparoscopy because it is diagnostic as well as it is therapeutic. So three presentations of endometriosis, whether it is pain, dyspareunia, chronic pelvic pain, uh, con uh, congestive dysmenorrhea, or there is infertility or there can be bilateral adenexal masses okay so laparoscopy remains the gold standard investigation now in this question they have asked which is not used in the treatment of endometriosis luprolide which is aromatase inhibitor and it will be an action is anti estrogen so it is used it can you know like is used to treat the endometriosis as such that means you treat the symptom of endometriosis medroxyprogesterone acetate is again used in the treatment of endometriosis because it is going to treat the symptom of menorrhagia okay and even ocps 
can be given to treat the symptom of menorrhagia and to treat the symptom of dysmenorrhea because the cycles will become the anovulatory. So continuous manner you are giving either the progesterone or a progesterone uh, releasing IUCD that is Mirena or you give OCPs. Okay, but mind it, they are not going to treat endometriosis. They are to treat the symptoms. The drug to treat endometriosis is GnRH analogs. And surgical management, you try doing the laparoscopic management. Estradiol and cabergolin has got no role. So if there was an option like A and B, I am going to mark A and B as my answer. Cabergolin is a drug of choice for anovulation uh, due to hyperprolactinemia. Okay. And bromocryptin is a drug of choice for hyperprolactinemia with anovulation with infertility. So that is what you are supposed to remember. So here the answer according to me will become A and B both. Luprolite and medroxyprogesterone acetate are given. Okay. Now, next, SRY gene is located on. Always remember, as whenever we are taking lecture, we have been telling the students that SRY gene is called as sex determining gene. And it is, it is located, located in distal portion of short arm of Y chromosome. Distal portion of short arm of Y chromosome. Now, what is the importance of this sex determining gene? So, it is located on short arm of Y chromosome and it is responsible that it is going to be a male child male child with xy 46xy is going to be the genotype of this child again this gene is responsible for <coughs> for transformation of undifferentiated gonad into testes so, karyotype will be 46XY, okay? Undifferentiated gonad at 7th week of pregnancy into testis. Testis usually have the Sertoli cells and testis have Leydig cells. Leydig cells in the intrauterine life produces testosterone, which is responsible for external genitalia development in the males and internal genital organ development in the males from the Wolfian duct. And Sertoli cells secrete Mullerian inhibiting substance, which inhibits the development of Mullerian duct because males should not have uterus. So remember, SRY gene is located on the distal part of short arm of Y chromosome. This is sex determining gene and there will be a normal male child with karyotype of 46XY. This gene is responsible for undifferentiated gonad at seventh week of intrauterine life to transform into testis and the gonad, gonad in this child or the fetus is going to be the testis which will contain Sertoli cells that secretes Mullerian inhibiting substance, which inhibits the development of Mullerian duct and will form remnants. And Leydig cells will secrete testosterone, which is responsible for external and internal genital organ formation in the male fetus. Okay. If there is any problem in the SRY gene, that will lead to a condition called as Sphere syndrome, which is pure gonadal dysgenesis. In that case, it is a baby with an uh, testis undescended in the inguinal region with an external genitalia of the female, but internal genital organs is uterus, cervix, fallopian tube and vagina. That is what is a sphere syndrome. S-W-Y-E-R syndrome, which is pure gonadal 
dysgenesis. Okay. SWYER syndrome, which is defect in the SRY gene. So it is pure gonadal dysgenesis. In this case, the genotype is a boy, but phenotype. So it is a cause of it is a cause of male pseudo harma prodite. Okay. So here the external genitalia will be female. External genitalia will be female, but there is uterus cervix fallopian tube present and there is undescended testis. So in this case, the treatment of this patient will be gonadectomy because this undescended testis is the risk factor for testicular tumors and you will give her estrogen progesterone so that there is a breast development that take place and there is a treatment for primary amenorrhea. So this patients you get with at puberty presenting with primary amenorrhea and there is no breast development and these are a female looking patients. There is no breast development because estrogen is not there. But when you have diagnosed, okay, by the clinical examination, flat females, okay, then external genitalia female, then there is inguinal hernia, you get an ultrasound done. So there is undescended testis and there is uterus present. And confirmatory is always your karyotyping. So it is 46XY. Then you counsel the uh, parents and you do gonadectomy after the puberty is attained and you transform them into girls because from the childhood, they know that they have born as girls. So you give estrogen progesterone, which will cause feminism, which will cause here uh, this uh, uh, the development of the breast. And then you... Uh, you know, like once you stop, they will have menstruation because uterus will start functioning if they will respond to the hormones. Now, complete gonadal dysgenesis, that is, I just said, uh, because of the SRY gene mutation, is it deletion, inversion, point mutation or translocation? So usually it is point mutation. Okay, I have just explained about the severe syndrome. Now, next, which of these will require evaluation of primary amenorrhea? So, this was a multiple answer question. Now, let me tell you what is primary amenorrhea. In a girl, primary amenorrhea. In a girl of 13 years of age or in a girl of 15 years of age. In a girl of 13 years of age, thilarchy. Pubarchy, minarchy, all absent. Or this usually goes in favor of Turner syndrome or streak, gonads or ovarian dysgenesis or gonadal dysgenesis. Okay. Or there is a female at 15 years of age, thilarchy and pubarchy. That means breast development, axillary pubic hair have developed, but there is no minarchy. So this usually goes in favor of Mullerian agenesis or it can go in cryptomenorrhea as well. Okay cryptomenorrhea as well because everything is normal but there is imperforate hymen okay so 13 and 15 so let us see if absence of menses by 15 years of age yes so that is primary amenorrhea correct no menses within three years of thilarchy that is again if the thilarchy has started and by 15 she does not get menses then also that is primary amenorrhea now high tsh with short stature that is if there is hypothyroidism hypothyroidism short stature 
then again thyroid hormones are required for development of you know like uh, normal menstruation there is a role of thyroid hormones as well so whenever there is an hyperthyroidism and it is a reproductive age group female it can lead to abortions hypothyroidism okay can lead to you know like uh, amenorrhea okay so this is again coming absence of thylarchy by 13 years of age so i think all of the above will fit into this answer okay next which of the following is seen in hrt hrt means hormonal replacement therapy hormonal replacement therapy and most common symptom for hrt is vasomotor symptoms like hot flushes sweating palpitations and what is the reason for hot flushes it is estrogen withdrawal okay so usually questions are being asked on hrt the symptom most common symptom that is hot flushes vasomotor symptoms and then they ask about osteoporosis because estrogen is known to increase the osteo blast activity and decreases osteoclast activity so when there is estrogen deficiency there <coughs> there is bone resorption so she is known to have fractures now in this case <coughs> hormonal replacement therapy decreases the risk of breast cancer no is it decrease the risk of endometrial cancer no they increase the risk because it is only estrogen that you are giving <laughs> increases the risk of a fracture or decrease the risk of colon fracture So the answer to this question is decreases the risk of colon cancer is a wrong answer. Fine, because here it is increasing, here it is increasing, and here it is decreasing. That will be the correct answer. So here the answer will be decreases the risk of colon cancer. Which of the following is incorrect? Cystocele colposuspension. Cystocele is when there is urinary symptoms because of the bladder neck prolapsing in the vagina. Okay, then there is a uh, uterine prolapse, vaginal hysterectomy, rectocele, posterior colporephy, and wall prolapse, sacrospinal uh, colposuspension. So sacrospinal ligament is used. That is, uh, vaginal vault suspension is. done that is the treatment of vaginal vault prolapse okay it can be done by laparoscopy so this is the correct answer uterine prolapse or utero vaginal vaginal descent or there is a cervical descent vaginal hysterectomy is done in elderly females surgery for rectocele is posterior colpo perineo rectum now uh, the options given to me by the students is rectocele posterior colporephy actually for rectocele that is a rectum prolapsing in the vagina the name of the correct surgery is posterior colporineo rectum and for the cystocele the surgery is anterior colporephy okay so this is the correct surgeries so unless until you give me the correct options i am not going i am not been able to comment upon this question okay so cystocele the correct surgery is anterior colporephy for the cervical descent or uterine prolapse the surgery is vaginal hysterectomy but we don't do in young females it is usually elderly females or those who have uh, you know like uh, those who have like uh, elderly means it is 60 plus or 70 plus or those who have completed their family 45 plus Uh, that is not elderly actually it comes in the middle age okay so instead of writing elderly i should write the age okay so it is cervical descent with those females who have completed their 
family and there is presence of cystocele rectocele. So we write vaginal hysterectomy with pelvic floor repair. Okay. Rectocele, the correct surgery is posterior colpoperineurephy, vaginal wall prolapses, sexo sacrospinous, uh, you know, like suspension where sacrospinous ligament is used to treat the vaginal wall prolapse. So these question, what is the exact options which was given? Only then I will be able to comment. The correct surgeries, I have written it here. Now, next question is a female presented with complaints of dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia on examination, uterus retroverted, tenderness in pouch of Douglas. The obstetrics questions, my colleague and friend, Dr. Anil has already discussed. So I'm discussing the gynae part of this. So do refer to that video as well. Now, female presented with complaints of dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia on examination, uterus is retroverted, tenderness in pouch of Douglas. So, this is a very, very clear cut case dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, uterus retroverted, tenderness in pouch of Douglas. It is the diagnosis is endometriosis and the gold standard, gold standard investigation is none other than laparoscopy. So, in the previous question, I have explained about this symptoms and I have explained about laparoscopy and I have explained about what are the presentations of three type of presentation symptoms like pain which is congestive dysmenorrhea. The next important symptom is dyspareunia where it is almost fitting into this question and third one is infertility. Okay. So here I am going to do a diagnostic laparoscopy. The advantage is I can convert into therapeutic if I find additions or if I find I have to treat the chocolate cyst on the laparoscopy. So that is what is an advantage of doing it. So that's all from all those questions which I have been able to collect from my students. That's all. And uh, hope this uh, exam was, you know, like you have been able to solve most of the OBS gynae questions perfectly.